Chapter 21 D. Lucky for us, when Chelsea said she would be here in thirty minutes, she had really taken an hour. She finally pulled down Beck's driveway and parked behind the garage, just as I was walking downstairs to wait for her. My hair was still dripping wet, but at least I didn't smell like sex anymore. A small smile forms when I think about how energetic Beck had gotten. I love when he takes me hard, but tonight he took me hard and rough, and there wasn't a second of it that I didn't love. You look happy, Dee, Chelsea comments from where she's sitting at the kitchen table, pulling me from my daydream. Beck had gone to pull her car into the garage, taken her luggage up to the guest room and looked over the letter she had received. I think he really just knew that he needed to make himself scarce while Chelsea came down from her panic. The second she pulled into the driveway, she slammed the car in park and rushed into my arms. She hadn't even shut the car off before she came running. She just stopped crying about five minutes ago. She hasn't moved from the seat that she dropped into, and I can tell that, even though she stopped crying, she hasn't been able to stop shaking. I am, Chels. I really am. I smile weakly and walk over the mugs of coffee I've just brewed. Here. I have a feeling we won't be going to sleep any time soon. Do you want to talk about it? I grab her cold hand and offer her the only thing I can. My strength. I know without a doubt that if I didn't have Beck by my side during all this— I would be feeling the same way as Chelsea, alone, afraid, and hopeless. This isn't the first time that I've realized how far I've come in my own healing, but right here in this moment, I realize that I finally, finally have all the power in my own happiness. I no longer fear the love Beck has to offer, but I also don't have the weight of every single ghost from my past choking me anymore. I'm mentally free from all the pain I've been carrying around, now all I have to do is get past this mess and enjoy the life I've been running from for too long. It's time to take the love and strength being offered and fight with every single breath in my body to make sure I win. Chelsea's deep sigh pulls me from my mental aha moment. I hate knowing she's worried, but I know how strong she is, and if anyone has the power to get past this with no scars, it's my girl. I'm here, Chelsea. I've had a bit longer to come to terms with the fact that Adam has turned my life into this mess, but please tell me you know that the guys won't let anything happen to us. She nods but doesn't speak. My heart breaks a little when I see a single tear fall from her eyes. She just looks at me, her dark brown eyes pleading with me to take everything away and make it all better. I don't even know how to express how I feel right now, Dee. I feel like just yesterday you were in the hospital— and I was terrified that you weren't going to wake up. Knowing that sicko is still out there, watching both of us now, is so scary. I know, I'm not going to lie. When I think about someone out there watching my every move, I feel the same way. We're going to get past this, and then we can look back and laugh. I smile, but I can tell by the look on her face that she knows I'm just trying to make light of the situation. There isn't anything good about this mess— we have no idea where Adam is, and even if we did, I don't know how I feel about turning someone over to a psycho, regardless of what he's done to get me into this position to begin with. There is no way I can come up with all that money, and even if I could, I wouldn't give it to him. My only hope is that the guys get lucky and find some hidden clue as to who he is, or we find Adam and get our answers there. What if they don't find him? What are we supposed to do, spend the rest of our lives in hiding? This guy beat you, D. He beat you so badly you almost didn't wake up. This isn't just some small-time asshole. This is huge. She's starting to get hysterical, and I have no clue how to answer her. I just nod my head and hold her hand tighter. Beck comes into the room a few minutes later and stands at the doorway. His face looks hard, and I can tell from the way he's holding himself that he isn't happy. My gut clenches in fear, but I quickly bat it down. I need to hold it together and prove to myself that I can handle this but also be the rock that Chelsea needs. Coop and Maddox are coming over in a few hours. It's late, and there isn't much we can do at three in the morning, so dump the coffee and let's get some sleep. He walks over to Chelsea and crouches down next to her seat. He waits for her to look at him before placing his hand on her shoulder, offering her the strength she needs. No one is going to hurt you, Chelsea. You and Dee are safe here, and I'm not leaving you two until we figure this out, Okay. She nods, gulps a few times to try to calm down, but loses the fight. 
I watch with my heart heavy as her body falls forward and she sobs into her hands. Beck stands before pulling her up from her seat and wrapping his arms around her. He looks over at me and I give him a small nod so that he knows I'm okay. He looks more worried about the fact that he's holding another woman in front of me. I give him a smile and reach out to squeeze his arm so he knows that I'm not upset with him. Chelsea needs him, and I know how comforting those strong arms are. He continues to hold her while she sobs into his chest, rubs her back, and reassures her that everything is going to be okay. Not once does he take his eyes off of me. If I weren't already head over heels in love with this man, this moment would have had me sold. Watching him hold one of my closest friends as she falls apart doesn't register anything other than the knowledge that he really would do anything to make sure that I and all those that I love are protected and happy. I love you, I mouth. I love you, he returns. I stand from my seat and dump out our full mugs of coffee. Walking over to where they stand, I wrap my arms around her back and kiss her cheek before heading out of the room. The sounds of someone moving up the stairs come about ten minutes after I've left the kitchen. It doesn't take long for the door to open and my heart to swell when I see Beck outlined against the hallway light. He walks into the darkened bedroom, stripping his clothes as he stalks towards the bed. I roll onto my side and wait for it, that moment, when he slides into bed and reaches over, pulling me deep into his arms and surrounding me in his protection. Are you okay? he whispers against my ear. I will be, I reply honestly, because I will be. We will get past this, and nothing is going to stand in my way now. I will be, I repeat. He doesn't answer, but then again he doesn't need to. He just pulls me tighter, pressing his chest to my back, his chin to my neck, and his arms tight around my body, it doesn't take long before his steady breathing is matching my own. Chapter 22 D. Rise and shine, you horny little humpers! I jump when Coop's voice booms through Beck's bedroom. I frantically pull the sheets over my naked body, but given the look on Coop's face, it's too late, and he's already seen my boobs. Nice tits, D. Yep, he definitely didn't miss them. You motherfucker, stop looking at her like that. Unconcerned with his nudity, Beck jumps out of the bed and rushes toward him. All my embarrassment disappears when I watch his firm, good-enough-to-eat ass as he runs out after Coop. It sounds like a herd of elephants running through the house as Beck chases him. Dude, if your dick touches me, I'm going to puke, Coop yells, his voice carrying through the house. He sounds so freaked out that I can't even hold back the laughter anymore. I start snickering so loud that I lose my hold on the sheet. Not even concerned about my state of undress, I climb out of bed to get dressed, wiping the tears that my laughter has brought from my face. With my naked back to the door, I bend over to pick up the shirt that Beck discarded last night, but when a masculine cough hits my ears, I jump and stand. Holy shit! I know it's not Coop because I can hear his gagging and Beck's yelling from further away in the house. Shit! Please tell me that you're gentleman enough to have your back to me! My voice wobbles and my face flames. Wouldn't exactly be able to enjoy the view if I did. Nice ass, Dee. Maddox's laughter echoes through the room before I hear the door shut and his heavy booted feet walking away from the door. I rush to throw some clothes on. I'm so embarrassed that my face feels like it might burst into flames. Thank God Beck was busy with Coop because I'm pretty sure his head would explode if he knew that both of his friends have seen me naked. Beck comes storming back in the bedroom with his hands covering his dick. I want to laugh, but when I see his face, I know that wouldn't be the best move. He takes one look at me, standing at the sink brushing my hair before stalking towards me. His hands drop and I watch in fascination as he grows harder with each step. I lick my lips and he growls. My eyes meet his in question and I'm met with pure, raw heat. He walks right up to me and, without a word, strips the clothes from my body, lifts me up so my ass rests against the vanity and rams into me. His movements are frantic and his pace rushed. He licks and bites along my neck and his fingers dig into my hips as he pounds into me. It doesn't take long for us both to tip over the edge. His lips slam down against mine, eating my screams while I swallow his grunts. He releases my lips and with his dick still deep inside me, 
locks eyes with mine. Do not shower. I want to know that I'm still inside you when you walk down those stairs and sit down at the table, and those assholes are sitting in the same room with you after just seeing what is mine. I want to know that I'm still all over this sweet pussy. Well, okay then, I nod, and when he pulls from my body, we both get dressed in silence before walking downstairs hand in hand. Chelsea looks different this morning. I can still see the lingering fear in her eyes, but now she also looks nervous. We've been sitting around the table for about thirty minutes, just making small talk while we eat some breakfast that the boys brought over. The whole time, Chelsea keeps looking over at Coop before quickly shifting her eyes away. She hasn't even eaten much, just keeps pushing it around her plate and worrying her lips. What in the hell? I know they hooked up while I was in the hospital last month, but Chelsea has told me that it was just one time, and she knows better than to get tangled up with Coop and his playboy ways. I know there aren't any feelings for him on her end, and knowing Coop as well as I do, I know there aren't any on his end either. He's completely oblivious to the awkwardness, just stuffs his face with more and more food. Beck squeezes my leg, and I look over at him. He tips his head towards Chelsea and just shakes his head once. I know he would tell me if he knew anything, so I nod and continue to eat. We finish up breakfast, and I busy myself with cleaning up the mess. I'll do anything to buy me some time before we sit down and talk about everything swirling around us. You need some help, Dee? Maddox asks. I blush, remembering him catching my ass in the air earlier. Nope, I got it all under control. I'm loading the last dish into the dishwasher. I can hear Beck and Coop talking at the table and glance over to see Chelsea still sitting there silently. Don't worry, just because I got an eyeful this morning doesn't mean I'm going to carry you off and enjoy the view up close and personal. My shocked gaze snaps to his, and when I see his dark eyes dancing with humor, I want to kick his ass. Not funny, asshole. I smack him down with the dish towel before walking back over to the table and sitting down. What was that all about? Beck asks, looking at Maddox with a glare. Nothing, just mad being a douche. His eyes narrow as he looks over at Maddox, who just holds his hands up in surrender. All right, so can we get this over with? I break the silence, praying that Beck will drop it. Maddox might be the most closed-off man I've ever met, but I know he didn't mean anything by his comments. He has apparently grown a sense of humor overnight, and even though it's at my expense, it's nice to see him not so closed off. Stop thinking about her ass, Beck growls, taking my hopes that we can just forget about this away in a flash. Seriously, just forget it, I snap. Beck breaks his heated staring contest with Maddox to look over at me. You saw you naked, D. You want me to just forget about it? His tone is low and lethal. I know he's seconds away from going all alpha man crazy. Oh, really? You know, I'm aware that he saw me naked, but it was also an accident. When you were running through the house with your dick flopping all over the place for everyone to see, you didn't see me going all crazy. Oh, no, I was laughing because, hello? It's funny. His nostrils flare and his eyes are still narrowed, but he doesn't say anything. Stop your shit, John Beckett. So what? Coop got a quick look at my girls and Maddox saw my naked ass. They aren't the ones that get the benefits of possessing this body. It's all yours. I didn't flip out when everyone in this house saw you, and I would appreciate it if you could tone that testosterone down a little. So would you please stop? Those two bastards didn't enjoy looking at my junk, but I know they enjoy the hell out of yours. For the love of God, it takes me a second to tone down my frustration. And if I'm honest with myself, it's hot as hell to watch him get all jealous and possessive. Are you forgetting about the very feminine set of eyes that got to take in all that is little Beck? Coop chokes on his drink when I finish talking. Maddox booms out a laugh that shocks me enough to look his way. If I weren't so frustrated with Beck right now... I might drool over how handsome he looks. How has no one noticed besides M just how good-looking he is? Even Chelsea seems to be zoned in on all that is Maddox Locke smiling and laughing. D, his growl has me snapping my eyes back to his. What? Eyes on me. Oh, you infuriating man! I stand up, shift until I am in his lap and press my mouth to his ear. Your tits, your ass... No one else's but yours. Yours to touch, lick, and kiss. No one else. Do I need to keep listing all the parts of me that belong to you? 
because baby we don't have enough time for me to list every single part of my body when i finish whispering in his ear i pull back and look into his eyes i want him to see how serious i am and how ridiculous his caveman act is his eyes are burning with emotion i can see how hard he's working to control this jealous urge of his the lust and desire that lights his eyes doesn't shock me but when I see his face go all soft, my words penetrate his thick head. I know he gets it. He understands. He out of everyone knows how big it is for me to admit that I belong to anyone. But more importantly, he gets it right here in the midst of his stupid jealousy that I am completely his. Mind, body, and soul. He closes his eyes and pulls me deeper into his arms. Chills rake through my body when he presses his lips against my temple and leaves them there, just breathes me in and takes the moment he needs. Well, as entertaining as it is to watch Beck go nuts, why don't we focus on the shit that needs focusing? I glare at Coop pissed that he interrupted Beck's in my moment. It pisses me off that all this shit with Adam and the asshole sending the letter has come at the worst possible time. What have you found out? Beck asks, never lessening up his hold on my body. His voice vibrates through my back, causing me to shiver. Not much from that letter. I'm going to drop it off with a buddy of mine at the police station and get them to run it for prints. No postmark, which we expected. So either he had someone drop it off at the office or he paid someone to do it for him. Either way, we most likely aren't going to get shit off that letter. Pictures are all local. Most of the ones of Chelsea are her coming and going from Robert's insurance. Nothing that leads me to believe he knows much about her personal life, which was also to be expected. Chelsea just happens to be his way of shaking D up, because he knows about their friendship. Maddox pauses for a second, and I take the moment to glance at Chelsea. She doesn't look as scared as she was last night, but she still looks worried. I do get lucky on Adam Harris. Seems that he isn't as stealthy as this other douchebag. Picked up a trace on his cell phone, local tower, so for some reason it seems to be in the Atlanta area. I'm still working on the rest, but he isn't using any bank or credit cards— mainly because he doesn't have any money in those accounts. There are a few shithole motels around where his phone is traced, but no luck finding him. For now, he's our number one concern. When Maddox finishes talking, I let out the breath I didn't realize I had been holding. They have nothing, well, nothing reassuring. So you're telling me that this Adam guy is local and very well could reach out and fucking touch me? I whisper. I notice Chelsea shudder out of the corner of my eye and regret the way I worded that. No one is going to get their hands on either one of you. The venom behind Coop's promise shocks me. I don't think I've ever seen him act like that before. He normally hides behind his don't-give-a-fuck immaturity. But this right here is a side to him I've never seen. I mean it. We won't let anything happen to you two. He looks away, and we're all silent for a minute, letting Maddox's news sink in. When Coop's cell rings a few minutes later, I jump in Beck's lap causing him to grunt when I land awkwardly. Thanks for that, babe. He groans, adjusting me better in his lap. Oh, I'll kiss it and make it better later. Coop checks his caller ID, and a big shit-eating grin takes over his face. In hurried movements, he accepts the call, stands, and places the phone to his ear. Ash, God, is it good to hear your voice. What? Who the hell is Ash? I look at Chelsea when I hear her gasp, and like a damn light bulb going on, it all makes sense. Damn, I knew I should have said something to her about getting mixed up with him. Regardless, if it was once or a few times, she obviously is upset knowing he's talking to another chick. Leave her alone, Dee. We need to focus on other things right now, and whatever's going on between those two is none of your business. I nod my head at Beck's whispered words and sit back to wait for Coop to return to the conversation. No one says anything while we wait. I can't hear what Coop is saying, but by the tone of his voice... He's happy to hear from the chick who's on the line. He comes back into the room about ten minutes later with a big stupid grin on his face. What? he asks when it's obvious that the mood in the room has shifted. Nothing. Let's talk about plan of action. Beck is quick to change the subject, and I notice Chelsea visibly relax. Right now we keep doing this. The girls stay here and so do you. Axel knows what's going on, and we all agree that their best protection is either here or at the office. When you need to leave... Coop or I will come stick around. I know you have a few security installs coming up this week. If you would have taught us how to install those bastards, then we could have taken those, but it's those high-end fancy motherfuckers. 
My guess is this unsub will make himself known when the ten days are closer to an end. Until then, we wait and try to find Adam. What the hell is an unsub? I ask the room when Maddox stops talking. Coop stops looking around the kitchen before giving me his attention. Unknown subject, babe. You have any Cheetos here? Jesus, Coop, could you at least pretend to pay attention? Beck barks, causing me to jump. I can tell Beck is frustrated, knowing there isn't anything we can do at the moment. Got it, I say meekly. So we sit and wait. This doesn't do anything to help reassure me. Regardless of how safe I feel with Beck and his ability to protect Chelsea and me, not having answers is downright terrifying. Don't worry, we're going to catch this jackass no matter what. Beck's words don't help. No matter what is the part that causes me the most concern. The thought of the happiness we've just now gotten back vanishing to some unknown threat and not knowing how to prevent it causes my heart to hurt. Stop, Dee. Just trust me to do whatever it takes to keep you and Chelsea safe. I nod my head at Beck's words and try to keep my breathing even, but inside, my gut is telling me that there is no way possible for this to end well. Chapter 23 Beck How are you taking all of this? I asked Dee later that night while we lay in bed. She lifts her head off my chest and rests her chin against her hand. She just looks at me for a few beats, not giving anything away, before she says anything. I'm scared. I know you don't want to hear that, but no matter how safe I feel in your arms, I can't help it. There is someone out there that wants to hurt me, wants to hurt Chelsea, and who knows who else. Beck, he could be anyone off the street. What if it's someone I pass every day and I have no clue? I get it, I do. But you have to believe and trust that we will keep you both safe. I won't let this asshole take you from me, Dee. I finally have you back in my arms, and I'll be goddamned if anyone threatens what we have. Her eyes close briefly, and she takes a deep breath. I just continue to rub my hands lightly against her back. I would give anything to take this fear from her, but I can't. Isn't that the kicker? I would do anything for this woman, and I am completely powerless in this situation. I do, I promise. I know you and the guys will do everything in your power to keep anything bad from happening. But that doesn't change the fact that the threat is here, and we have no idea how to stop it. I can hear the desperation in her tone. I shift our bodies so that we're laying on our sides facing each other. Listen to me. You've come so far, Dee. Not just with your personal demons, but, baby, you finally let it all go. The pain, the fear, all of it is gone, and you better believe that I will fight an army if it means I keep this look of peace in your eyes. You hear me? I refuse to ever let you feel powerless or afraid. As long as I'm here, you will never, ever feel that darkness touch you again. I wipe the few tears that have fallen from her eyes and kiss her lightly. Forever, baby. You and me, forever. Forever, she echoes with a wobbly smile. She burrows as close as she can get, wraps her arms around my body, and tangles her feet with mine. Not once throughout the night does her hold let up. My girl knows exactly where she's meant to be, and exactly who will move heaven and fucking earth to make sure that not one hair on her head is harmed. Frustrated doesn't even come close to describe how I'm feeling right now. It's been eight days since we all sat down at my house to put all the cards on the table. Eight long days with nothing. Not one fucking thing. The unsub hasn't sent another letter, hasn't called, no smoke signals, not a damn thing. Dee's doing her best, but I can tell she is worried. I've been keeping a close eye on her. My worst fear is that she will start pulling into herself again. I know from experience that PTSD does never completely go away. Some people go their whole lives after treatment ends and don't have a setback, while others have triggers. So far, I haven't seen anything that leads me to believe that she is struggling. For now, I just have to wait and watch her. She's promised me that if she feels like things are getting dark again, that she will immediately call Dr. Maxwell. Even through all of this, she's staying strong, and fuck, that feels good. It's probably the only damn good thing that's come out of all this. I have my girl, and she has herself back. Sighing deeply, I toss my pen down on my desk and turn to the latest email from Maddox. Apparently, Adam's last call on his cell has been traced to a few towns over. 
He doesn't seem to think we should be concerned yet, but I know he feels the heat of the flames getting closer. We're trained to trust our instincts. We don't spend years overseas fighting an invisible army not to have a fine-tuned gut. Trouble is coming. And just like overseas, we have no idea from which direction things are going to blow. The ringing of my phone wakes me up from my thoughts. Caller ID shows Greg calling. And that earns another frustrated groan. He's been calling for the last few days, wondering if he can swing by to talk to Dee. I've been trying to put him off, because with everything else swirling around us, I need him to focus. No matter what, when he and Dee have their talk, he's going to feel that, and he's going to feel it hard. Beck, I bark. You doing okay, brother? About as good as I can be doing. Ready to pull my hair out if we don't start getting answers soon. How is it possible for one motherfucker to be a complete ghost? And this Adam shit? He's not even careful, and we still can't fucking find him. We're trained goddamn marines, and two idiots are besting us. I don't even think frustrated comes close to how pissed I am. Fuck, that felt good to get off my chest. I haven't wanted to pile all of that on D. She knows I'm worried, but I don't want her to take my shit on top of her own fears. I understand. These guys will screw up, and when they do, we'll be there. He sounds just as pissed as I am, so at least I know I'm not alone here. Anything new on your end? Not a thing. Maddox stayed at the office all night monitoring the computers. Unfortunately, that asswipe turns his phone off when he's done making a call. Whatever kind of idiot he might be, he at least knows his shit when it comes to tracking. That's what I'm afraid of, Greg. He could be on my doorstep, and we wouldn't fucking know. I need to punch something. Pound the shit out of anything to get rid of all this stress and anger. You've got eyes on the place and a security system that would make the White House look like child's play. Try to take a breath for a minute. Not that easy, Greg. Not even close to being that easy. One day. That's all we have left until she's supposed to meet some impossible deadline. And now I have her going stir-crazy. I know she isn't used to being stuck inside without being able to leave. Why don't you bring her down to the office? I know it isn't the spa, but at least it gets her out of the house, and we can still keep an eye on things here. The hopeful sound to his voice has me narrowing my eyes. I hate questioning his motives, but I know exactly why he wants me to bring her there. Don't play me for a fool, Greg. I know you want to talk to her, and I'm not trying to stand in the way of that. But are you sure you really need to do this now? In the middle of all this bullshit, you want to open this can of worms? I need to know, brother. It's killing me, not knowing, and thinking the worst. If anything, knowing will be better than the thoughts that have been rolling around in my head. Melissa thinks the same thing as you, that I need to wait until this is over, but fuck me, I just can't. Yeah, I hear you, but this shit... Greg, make sure you really want to know, because it can't be unknown. I know you, and I know how you feel about the females in your life. I'm not even going to lie to you. When Dee told me everything, I felt that hard enough that the earth shook. That's my woman, my life, so I felt that, and I still feel it. I know she's like a sister to you, and it doesn't matter if there isn't a relationship between you two like the one I have with her. That shit will hurt. I spit the last few words out, gripping the phone so tightly I'm sure it will snap. Hell, I lived most of it right by her side, and I didn't even know the half of it. Right. That doesn't change things for me. I need to know, Beck. I've already heard it from Axel. Izzy was in tears for almost three full days. You don't think I get that this shit is heavy? I know, and that's what keeps running through my head. One of the most important people in my life was in pain for years, and I couldn't see shit. I have to know. We don't talk after that. I can feel my neck getting tight in frustration, and I growl in the phone. Fuck. It's not just about you, Greg. I don't want this to set her back, I say quietly. What? He whispers, his voice deadly calm. Set her back from what? I realize my mistake right when the words come out. If I had any hope of calling him off before, now it's gone. He's going to know with those words that it is probably as bad as he has imagined. I'm coming over. You want to sit in on this talk? That's fine, but I'm on my way. When I hear the phone disconnect, I slam the receiver down and push back from my desk with enough force to cause my chair to crash down. Fuck me. Looks like I need to go let Dee know that a storm's coming. Chapter 24 D. I need out of this house. 
and not being able to just go whenever I want is probably the only reason that I am so antsy to leave. At this point, I don't even care where the hell I go. I just want to see something other than the walls of Beck's home. Chelsea's handling this a whole hell of a lot better than I am. Either that or she's just hiding it better. I think her toes have been painted and repainted about fifty times. I've tried to get her to tell me what's going on with her and Coop, but she just evades the question. If I didn't think something was going on before, I definitely do now. This morning has been exceptionally boring. We have all the work done for the next week, it seems. When all that you have is time, it's amazing the stuff that gets finished. I've contacted a real estate agent that I know back in North Carolina and told him that I want it sold. Gone. I don't want to ever see that building again. So far, there haven't been any issues with my clients. They know that I will still be handling their business. It just won't be from the same state. The policyholder that Adam had screwed with wasn't too happy when I explained the situation. Luckily, since it had only been a few hundred dollars, they agreed to take a settlement in order to not press charges. Regardless of how many times I explain the situation, I know there will never be a chance of getting business from them or anyone close to them in the future. For the first time in almost ten years, the job I love is becoming something I hate. I had just finished emailing the agent handling the sale of Robert's Insurance, N.C. Things are looking good for a quick sale. I didn't expect to get a bite within the first week of putting the listing up, but so far there are two companies with heavy interest. Thank God. D. I smile when Beck's voice carries out of the house onto the deck where I'm relaxing with Chelsea. I shut my laptop and look over at her. I'll be right back. Do you need anything? She looks up from her own computer for a second, shakes her head, and returns her attention to whatever she's working on. Walking through the double doors and back into the living room, I make my way towards where I hear his heavy steps echoing from the front of the house. I round the corner into the foyer and almost collide with Beck. Whoa there, big boy, where's the fire? The smile on my lips slips away when I notice the look in his eyes. What is it? I whisper. He doesn't answer right away. He pulls me into his arms and just holds me. My anxiety is climbing. It really could be anything as long as we have some sick fuck out there watching our every move. Beck, please, talk to me. Greg's on his way. I tried. I really did. I know you aren't ready to have this talk, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. I'll sit with you if you need me to, but I think he needs to know what really went on. His eyes are pleading with me to understand, and I get what he's saying. Until Greg knows everything, it won't be out of the way and in the past. Okay. Wrapping my arms around him, I let his comforting scent and strong body ease some of the tension from me. I know you would sit there with me, and that means the world, but we both know you don't want to reopen that wound. We've moved past it, and I don't want to see that pain in your eyes again. I need to do this on my own. Are you sure? His arms pull me in tighter, and I smile against his chest. What did I do to deserve this man? Yeah, baby, I'm sure. I pull back and look up into his loving eyes. It's something I need to do. I need to stop leaning on you for my strength. He offers me a small smile and an understanding nod. I love you. Thank you for understanding. I love you, too. His lips press against my forehead, and I close my eyes, relishing his touch. I don't like leaving you, and I know you might need me, but I get it. How about I take Chelsea down to the office? I'm sure she would love to visit with Sway, get out of the house, and have his crazy-ass pamper her. It's almost lunchtime anyway, so someone can chill next door with her while Sway does his thing. That sounds perfect. I'm going to go change out of my pajamas. Come find me before you head out. He gives me another soft kiss, but lingers when my tongue dances across his lips, asking for access. When we finally break apart, he pulls me in for another tight hug before taking off through the house, calling for Chelsea. With a deep breath, I head up the stairs to get ready for Greg's arrival. Beck had come to tell me that Greg is here before heading out with an excited Chelsea, Regardless of the reasons for them leaving the house, I'm happy that she'll be able to breathe some fresh air. Maybe when I finish this heart-to-heart, -heart, I can talk Greg into letting me leave, too. I might as well take advantage of these overgrown apes offering their protection. 
Walking down the stairs and through Beck's large house makes me feel like I'm walking the length of ten football fields. Knowing that Greg's waiting, and that the conversation with him isn't going to be a nice, happy one, makes the walk even more daunting. I hear him puttering around the kitchen when I reach the hallway leading into the living room. I take a deep breath and come out of my hidden sanctuary. His head snaps around when he hears my footsteps against the hardwood floor. I can feel the distance between us and the energy floating through the rooms. Hey, I smile weakly as I walk around the thick leather chair that Beck and I love to cuddle in and run my fingertips along the back, hoping to ground myself to something that Beck's touched. It might sound stupid, but just that little touch makes me feel like he's right here with me. Greg doesn't speak. He just stands behind the little half-walled breakfast bar that separates the kitchen and the living room. His blue eyes, which normally hold nothing but kindness and love, are clouded with worry. God, I hate this. I wish he could have just remained oblivious to all of this shit. You want to go sit outside? It's a nice afternoon. I try to smile again, but he still just stands there looking at me. Can you please say something? He breaks eye contact and looks off to the side, just staring into space. I know he's thinking, because he runs his hands through his hair a few times, drops his head, and holds the back of his neck, just shaking his head lightly. Please? His head pops up, and the pain behind his eyes squeezes my heart. Between Izzy and Greg, I think I always knew he would handle things the worst. Even though we didn't even know each other when the majority of this shit went down— it doesn't matter to him. I'm his family, and if anything happens to his family, he feels like it's his own pain. He takes a few more minutes before walking towards me. His eyes never leave mine until I'm forced to look away when his chest crashes into my face. His arms wrap around me in a vice-like grip. He just stands here holding me as if he's afraid that if he lets go, I'll fly away. I give him this, sliding my arms against his thick torso and holding him just as tight. His heart races against my ear, and his breathing is coming in rapid pants. My heart breaks a little, knowing that there is no way to explain this without hurting him more. I'm sorry, I mumble against his chest. Are you kidding? What the hell do you have to be sorry for? He pulls back, and my arms fall from his body and hang lamely by my sides. His warm grip against my biceps keeps me standing when I see the emotion in his face. I didn't mean to hurt you. We've always been able to tell each other everything, but this... This was just something that I didn't know what to do with. It's taking me a lot to get to this point, Greg. You had so much going on last year that, even if I had been ready to talk, there was no way that I could have thrown this on you, not with everything that was going on with Melissa and Cohen. Things got a little crazy for a few months when Greg almost lost his son because of a crazy grandparent— not to mention the drama he went through with that whore he used to sleep with. Now that Melissa is almost six months pregnant with their twins, and they are all finally happy, things are definitely in a better place for me to let him in. He has someone to help him ease his mind from this. God, Dee, you know I would do anything to help you. You've been my family for years. When family needs you for whatever reason, you're there. Don't you realize how much the people in your life love you? He looks so confused. Damn, this is not going to be good. Come on, let's go sit down. He lets my arms go and follows behind me. I walk back around Beck's chair, once again trailing my hands across the soft leather. I close my eyes and picture his handsome face, smiling and full of love. I let my body fill with his love and open my eyes with a new determination. I sit down on the couch and pat the cushion next to me, Greg smiles and shakes his head with my action. I've seen him do that a million times with Cohen, so he knows it's my poor attempt at throwing some lightness into this darkness that's swirling around us. I'm just going to start at the beginning, and as hard as this is going to sound, just please, let me finish before you say anything. He nods his head, and I take a deep breath before I start telling my story. He doesn't move once as I begin speaking— I start with my childhood and work my way up through high school. His eyes get hard a few times, mainly whenever I mention my father. I pause for a second before I tell him about Brandon breaking into my office. I know he'll be able to handle that part, 
but it's going to be a stretch thinking that he'll be able to control his anger when he finds out just how bad it got. My eyes have been watching my fingers play with a string hanging from my shirt while I try to figure out how to tell him the rest. D. I look up and see his puzzled gaze. The question in his eyes and the understanding nod show me that he realizes that this is part of the ban I've been keeping from him. Go on. Please. I open my mouth a few times before I get the words out. I keep my eyes glued to his as I tell him about the first attack Brandon made against me, the rape, and the fear that kept me from saving Izzy before she was finally able to free herself. I rush to get each word out, because with each continuing second, I watch a little part of one of my best friends break apart and splinter into a million pieces. I don't think I ever dealt with it, at least not like a normal person would. I pushed it under the rug and continued to live my life the only way I knew how at the time. I pause and look away from his angry eyes for a second, trying to calm my nerves. When he hurt Izzy, that time at the condo we had, I think that was the start. Beck noticed and didn't let me cave in. But even he couldn't save me from myself. We had the most amazing week together before it all blew up and the lights went out of my life. His eyes narrow in question but he doesn't interrupt me. It was a few weeks after Izzy got hurt. I had been pushing him away and doing my best to keep him in a nice little box so that he wouldn't work his way into my heart. But Beck worked his way in. I smile, remembering those early days. We didn't even have a chance to tell anyone. Funny how that works. Everyone thought that we'd been playing these bedroom games for the last two years, but in reality, he's held my heart the whole time. I shake my head. I still can't believe that Beck was the only one who ever noticed my pain. Well, Beck and Maddox. But Mad never let on that he has been silently watching my private struggle. I wasn't even upset that you guys didn't notice, you know? I whisper the words, but he jerks when I finish talking. I swing my eyes back to his face and flinch when I see his eyes and lips pressed tight. I have to look away to get the rest out. Part of me wants to scream at him. But I know whatever angry words I might say, he doesn't deserve them, and knowing him, he's beating himself up worse than I ever could. It's no one's fault but my own that I shut down and didn't know how to process the pain. I wore the masks I needed to wear, and I locked them out. I was my own worst enemy. After you got shot and all of the stuff with Brandon finally ended, something inside of me shut down. I didn't know how to deal with everything— the memories of what he had done to me and to Izzy. I couldn't see past the fear he had brought back when I was tied and at his merciless hands. Seeing Izzy's life so close to being taken and you, Jesus, Greg, watching you almost die, I shut down. The depression wasn't even a match against the rest of the battles raging inside of me. Beck was there every step of the way for months until I finally succeeded in pushing him away. I keep my eyes locked with his as I finish my story. I tell him about the times Beck saved my life, the therapy I've been in for the PTSD, and everything in between. When the first tear falls from his eyes, I almost have to stop talking, but somehow I manage to get to the end. When the last word leaves my mouth, he takes a great shuddering breath. He stands from the couch and walks over to the window overlooking the backyard. I can see his reflection against the glass. His eyes are closed tight, and I watch him struggle with his control. Right when I'm about to open my mouth and beg him to say something, anything, his eyes open and he turns, just staring at me. His eyes are full of unshed tears, and his Adam's apple is bobbing with the force of his emotions. He opens his arms and I move quickly from my spot on the couch. It's only a few steps, but when his arms come around and close tight around my body, I let out a sob. He buries his head in the crook of my neck, and I can feel the wetness of his tears against my shoulder. His big, powerful body is shaking with the enormity of his grief. We stand here for the longest time, just offering each other the strength needed. I know he needs to let all of it sink in, and if we have to stand here for hours, then so be it. By the time he pulls back, my own tears have wet the fabric of his shirt. His eyes are dry but bloodshot and the sadness in his gaze causes my own tears to come rushing back. I'm sorry, I repeat my earlier words. He shakes his head and offers me a small smile. 
The way I see it, you have nothing to be sorry for, D. As much as it tears me apart to know you were fighting all of that and didn't tell anyone, I look at you now on the other side of all that pain, and I couldn't be more proud. Bex, you're rockin', babe. Even if I hadn't been so foolishly blind, I'm pretty sure that he's the only one that would have ever been able to help pull you back up. God, it's eating me up to know what you've been living with. He shakes his head, clearly still trying to calm the emotions that I brought forth. I don't blame you. I don't want you to think that even once during all this time that I blamed you for not seeing. I didn't want you to see. I hid and put the happiness onto the extreme. You can't beat yourself up when I did my best to make sure that you couldn't see. That's on me, Greg. I can tell he doesn't agree with me, but he doesn't argue. Don't keep things from me anymore, D. Family doesn't do that shit. His eyes lose a little of the sadness and his tone gets sharp. I silently let some of the worry seep from my body when I realize the worst is over. I won't. I promise. Are you doing okay with everything that's happening right now? You aren't struggling or anything. I know what he's asking. He wants to know if I'm sinking and need a life vest. Yeah, Greg, I'm really doing okay. I'm worried, but I think that's pretty normal. I've called Dr. Maxwell a few times since I've been back from the hospital. She's helped me stay on track, and to be honest... I don't feel the hooks of my old fears at all. I'm stronger now. Between all of my coping techniques and everything that is John Beckett, I'm pretty close to normal. I still have my moments, but most of the time those are a few nightmares that keep me up, and even those are coming less frequently. And Beck, you two are good? We're amazing. The conviction behind those words has Greg's smile coming out, and for the first time since he got here, the smile I return isn't forced and it washes all of the pain from my body like a waterfall. The thought of Beck and all the love we share is enough to heal even the deepest of my wounds. Thank you for telling me. I know that wasn't easy, and I'm not going to lie to you, it hurts like hell. But I'm glad that you let me in. He takes a deep breath and looks me hard in the eyes. If you ever keep shit like that from me again, I'm going to let Melissa kick your ass for me. We both laugh, and just like that, the mood is lifted. And even though the pain lingers in his eyes, I know that everything is going to be okay. Chapter 25 Beck I'm about two seconds from climbing the walls of my office. I have been here for almost two hours and haven't heard a word from Greg or Dee. Axel and Coop have been giving me my space, and I'm thankful for it. Axel came in when I first got here, and I almost took his head off with one of the books I threw at him. Coop doesn't even bother. He takes one look at me and keeps walking past my office until I hear the door close to his own. Emmy is the only one I've been able to talk to, and even that's been with a bark to my tone. Maddox takes one for the team and spends the next two hours next door with Chelsea. Sway doesn't pick on Maddox as much as he does the rest of us, and even when he does, Maddox doesn't seem too bothered by it. The knock on my door pulls me from my own head, and I look up to meet Coop's hesitant eyes. I've got to run out for about an hour. We've got another stalk and snap case. Another rich homemaker who has convinced her husband is sleeping with the secretary. He laughs and shakes his head. This is exactly why my ass won't ever let a chick get her hooks in me. I would end up being a case on your desk to come stalk and snap. You know, the best thing that's ever happened to me is having Dee return my love. So, I won't ever see where you're coming from there. Leave it to Coop to lighten the lead ball in my gut. Where the hell are Dee and Greg? I'll take your word for that one, brother. You know I respect you assholes and your relationships, but that shit just isn't for me. I'm not the kind of guy worth some chick's trouble. Too many mommy issues. We all have our own issues to bear, Coop. You'll get your happiness one day. I frown when I see the serious look he's putting out. Don't hold your breath there. Anyway, you need anything while I'm out? I shake my head, but before I can answer, my phone rings. I wave him off and swipe the phone to answer, letting the tension fall from my shoulders when I hear Dee's voice come over the line. Hey, guess what? She sounds happy, so at least I can stop picturing her hiding in the closet in a ball. What's that? 
I'm finally leaving the house. And before you start telling me a million reasons why I shouldn't leave, you don't have to worry. Greg's with me. We're going to swing by and grab some takeout before we come to you. Will you ask everyone if they want anything? I can't help but smile when her tone hits my ears. There isn't even a sliver of the sadness that I have been expecting. I know that the talk they had wasn't easy, but I also know that Dee isn't the same person she was a few months ago. She's proven today just how far she's come. My girl is strong, and she did it all on her own. Yeah, baby, give me a second. She hums her agreement, and I place her on hold long enough to go ask Axel and Emmy what they want. You there? Yup. My heart expands a little more with every word she speaks. Yeah, she's got this. You're going to have to call either Maddox or Chelsea. She's been next door for about a couple of hours now with Maddox standing guard. Coop ran out to meet with a new client, but whatever you get him will be fine. I finish up telling her what Axel and Emmy want before reminding her to grab her handgun and to keep it in her purse with her at all times. With her assurance and the knowledge that I know Greg will protect her, we hang up and I start my new stream of worries. I wouldn't be as calm as I am knowing that she's left the safety of my house if I didn't know she has protection. I might not be there, but Greg can handle anything that pops up, and the fact that he's got her concealed doesn't hurt. That was one of the first things we did when we returned home from North Carolina. After she was well enough, I went out and bought her a Glock of her own, and then we went to get her permit to carry concealed. She hasn't had the chance to fire it yet, but she knows how to use it. And just knowing that she's got some way of protecting herself makes me breathe a little easier. The thirty minutes it takes for her to walk into my office seems like forever. I've been close to pacing the room when she comes breezing in. I stand here next to my office window and take a moment to drink her in before I am able to move. She's wearing a black tank top and a pair of white shorts that cover just enough to make her decent. Her long, bronzed legs seem to go on forever, and of course, she's got on a pair of white and black polka-dot heels. The things those shoes of hers do to my body should be illegal. Snap out of it there, handsome. You'll have to wait to act out all those dirty thoughts flying around in your head until we get home. Lunch is served. She walks her sexy ass over to my desk and starts emptying the contents of her bag. I let out a painful groan when she bends over to pick up a pack of soy sauce that fell from the bag. God damn that ass. She laughs and tosses my fork at me before sitting down and starting to eat without me. It takes me a few seconds before I can will my dick to calm down, and then I walk over towards her. I bend down and kiss her deeply before pulling my chair closer to her. We eat in a comfortable silence, both of us just happy enough to be together right now. I know why I have been so anxious. I needed to see for myself that she was really okay. Even if she doesn't speak the words, I know that she's here because after that talk with Greg, she needed me. And damn if that doesn't feel fucking great. It really brings it all home, just how far we've come. Before, she would keep shutting me out and would never allow me to think that she needed me. Now, now she doesn't even have to think about it. She needed me, so she came and got me. Where's Greg? It's driving me nuts not knowing how things went, but I don't want to push her to talk about it unless she wants to. Mainly, I just want to make sure that she really is okay. He's eating in the conference room with Axel. I brought Maddox, Chelsea, and Sway their food before I took the little happy trail of joy to get in here. I swear, I don't know why you guys let Sway leave that on the sidewalks. She laughs and I shake my head, remembering when Sway spent two whole days painting the sidewalk in front of the business strip gold with glitter speckled all over the place. We all gave him a hard time about it, but he's got a point. There isn't anyone around that can walk on that ridiculous paint without a smile. Anyway, drop Demi's off with her, but she was on the phone when I came in, so I'll go catch up when we finish our little lunch date. She turns back to her food, takes a few bites before closing up what's left, and walking over to the fridge in my office to save the rest. I toss the empty containers for my meal in the trash can and pull her into my lap when she walks back over to take her chair. She giggles and wraps her arms around my neck. Hey, she whispers against my lips. Hey, I almost didn't get the word out before her lips crush against mine. She takes my mouth in a rough kiss that shows me just how desperate she had been to get here. I answer every move she makes. Our tongues dance together, and it doesn't take long before her kiss starts to turn more heated. I pull back and give her a minute. Her eyes are still closed, and her breath comes in quick bursts against my face. 
She takes a few beats before her lips curl into a beautiful smile. It feels like I've been handed the whole world in my hands when she gives me that smile. It's the one I've been craving for so long. There's nothing fake or forced about it. When she opens her eyes, the blinding joy that is like a blazing fire inside her spills out. I give her a smile in return, and let the rest of the stress and worry from the day just pour off of me. She lays her head against my shoulder and shifts so she's more comfortable in my lap. I keep one arm around her back to support her body, but take her small hands and wrap mine around them, rubbing her silky skin with my fingers. Things went well today? I nod my head and give her the space she needs to keep talking. He took it about as hard as I thought he would, but in the end, you're right. He needed to know, and I feel so much more free. She laughs, and the sound wraps around me. I close my eyes and savor this moment between us. He's going to be okay. I know this isn't something that he'll just snap and be over, but he has Melissa and Cohen to help him get through it. She leans up pulls her hands free and frames my face. Her thumbs rub the stubble of my day's worth of beard a few times before she brings her mouth to mine, giving me a small kiss before pulling away. And I have you. She smiles, and right there I can see it. She's moved on and is finally letting every single last one of those things that has been hurting her go. Like a sea of balloons being released into the sky, you can almost physically see her letting it all go. Always. If possible, her smile gets even bigger before she lays her head back down and pushes her arms around my chest. With our hearts beating together, and a peace like I haven't known in a long time settling around us, I just enjoy this moment. Greg walks by my office door, and I turn my head to see what he needs. He nods his head and gives me a look that confirms what Dee just said. He's okay but he's going to need a little while before he can move on from what he now knows isn't what he thought. He stands there for a few minutes and keeps his eyes on Dee's back. I can't tell what's running through his mind, but then he silently looks back up and offers me one hell of a look. He's got his approval, acceptance, and happiness that Dee is in good hands. That right there is the look of the man who has accepted responsibility for Dee as if she were his own blood relation letting go and allowing me to take over that honor. Chapter 26 D. After lunch with Beck, I spend some time with Emmy while we wait on Chelsea to finish up with Sway. According to Maddox's last grunt-filled one-word response phone call, she is happily being fluffed like a fucking bird. I start laughing so hard that I almost drop the phone when he tells me that Sway has already tried to sit on his lap twice. Those guys can play all they want, but they secretly love the attention that Sway is not shy about throwing at them. We need to get Sway a man. Not just any man, but we need someone that could stand up next to these CS boys and belong. Certified grade A hunk material. Emmy looks up from where she's entering some notes from an earlier meeting the guys had and drops her jaw. You aren't seriously thinking about playing matchmaker, right? Why not? It shouldn't be that hard to find him someone. I bet if we checked Craigslist right now, there would be a million men looking for companionship. Emmy snorts. Yeah, maybe if you were in the market to start pimping, you can't pick him a man off Craigslist. That's just dirty. Okay then, Ms. I know everything. Where would you like to find him a man? Across my arms and huff. Um, how about I don't? I have enough trouble with my own dates, let alone picking up someone else's. She turns her attention back to the computer, effectively cutting me off. Whatever. I turn around from the front desk and take in their lobby. I was shocked when Greg told me that the guys did all their own decorating. The lobby is pretty dark, but still welcoming. Emmy's desk is the center of attention when you walk in the door, literally. The first thing you can see. Then, of course, there's the core security logo in huge black letters behind her head. The walls are a dark gray, and on either side of Emmy are two thick black couches. Both sitting areas have a gray coffee table with various piles of crap magazines on them. We had finally talked the guys into adding some red accents around the place to at least make it look a little happier, unless my wife is cheating will you catch her gloomy. I walk over to the left of her desk, pick up the most recent People magazine, and start flipping the pages. Emmy, we've got to take an important call in the conference room. 
So hold all the other calls. And when Coop comes back, tell him to get in here. Beck's voice draws my attention away from the magazine. He walks over and gives me a brief kiss. You okay up here for a second? We're just right down the hall. I smile up at him and reach out to rub the frown from his brow. I'm fine. Emmy and I were just discussing the benefits of getting into the pimping trade. So just go along and let us work our magic. He walks away with a smile and all traces of his frown gone. You are nuts, Emmy says from her desk, punctuating each word with a hard snap of the keyboard. But you love me, we both laugh. But before she can go back to her work, I ask her the one question I know she hates to be asked. So, how are things with Maddox? She loses the small smile on her face and stops what she's doing. Things aren't anything, and they won't be anything. That man is impossible. You're giving up? I really never expected her to hold on to her flame for him this long, but I have been hoping that he would at least let her in when he realized how awesome she is. It's for the best, Dee. Before I can reply, Coop comes dancing in the door, running his fingers through his shaggy blonde hair. We both start laughing when we notice a gold glitter falling from his locks. This isn't funny. I swear Sway is some kind of tracker on my truck. Ever since Greg told him I was some glitter fairy, he finds a need to come shower that shit all over me. I can't hold back the laughter. I have to walk over to the desk and hold on so I don't fall over and squeeze my legs together so I won't pee in my pants like a little kid. I'm so busy laughing that I miss the second the mood shifts from light and laughing to deathly serious. I'm wiping the tears from my eyes when I notice something out of the corner of my eye. I take in Emmy's stark white face and bug down eyes before looking over at where Coop is standing. He's frozen with his hands still in his hair, but his attention isn't on the glitter anymore. I have never, not once in the two years that I've known him, seen him look like this. Playful and joking Coop has been replaced with someone that would give Maddox a run for his money. He looks absolutely lethal. Do you get your ass behind the desk? No. Coop's voice sounds the same, only much harder. I try to move, but the second I shift, the figure standing in the doorway turns his attention back towards me. I don't even need to focus on him to tell that he's pointing a gun right at the side of my head. The sickening click of him releasing the safety is all I needed to hear. If you even think about moving a fucking inch, I'll put a goddamn bullet through your head. You would think that when you hear the voice of someone you know has clearly gone in fucking sane, that he would at least sound demonic. But no, Adam sounds just like the same southern frat boy I hired not too long ago. Adam, put the gun down and let the girls go. Let's me and you sit down and talk, I beg. I try to swallow the lump of fear that's crawling up my throat, but my mouth is bone dry. I sneak a glance at Emmy to see that her face is impossibly pale and she has tears streaming down her face. Shit! Okay, think, Dee. I can feel the claws of my own personal hell trying to latch on and pull me under, back into that darkness that I've finally overcome, but I'll be damned. There is no way in hell that I'm going to finally move past that to find my own happiness, then have some motherfucking cokehead take it away from me. I've nothing to say to you. All these ass fucks have been in my business. You don't think I know you's been looking for me? No, I ain't letting you take me to him. He sounds high as a kite. Surely I can make it behind the desk and grab my purse. I made sure that my Glock was loaded before I put it in my purse earlier. All I need to do is get a little closer. Don't fucking move, bitch! His maniacal screams cause me to jump, and I reach out to grab the desk again to help keep me from falling. Please, Adam, I beg. I just need to buy a little time to get behind the desk. Fuck! Why haven't the guys come out? Surely they... Oh, God, they're in the conference room. The conference room isn't just in the back of the building, but it's also completely soundproof. My heart sinks when I realize that, unless Maddox comes back, there isn't anyone to help us. No, no, no! My mind flashes back to where Brandon held Izzy and me hostage. He was the same kind of crazy, bashing his head with the gun and pulling frantically at his hair. The only difference is that Adam looks completely insane— while Brandon was able to hide his under his perfect exterior. The gun never wavers when he starts rocking back and forth, muttering under his breath. His beady eyes look over every single inch of the lobby, pausing to leer at Emmy behind the desk before a sick smile curls his lips. Who's this little thing? You sure do look a lot like that bitch Chelsea. Where's that little shit? 
His bloodshot eyes swing back towards me, and I flinch when I see his vacant expression. She isn't here, Adam. She's back in North Carolina. I hold my hands up and hope that by showing him I'm not a threat, he will drop the weapon and give us enough time to take control. I can see Coop shift just slightly, and I know he's trying to get to his gun. He's the only one out of the group of corpsmen that keeps his gun in a shoulder harness, and there isn't a way he can get to it without drawing more attention. Adam, I start, trying to make sure he's looking at me. Why didn't you just tell me you needed help? I would have helped you. I keep my tone calm and hopefully void of the terror that is washing through my body. You ain't fooling me, Dee. I know what kind of sneaky bitch you are. His laugh comes out completely possessed. You couldn't just keep your nose out of my business. No, you had to come in and fuck everything up. I back up a step when he turns his attention back to Coop. Stop fucking moving! He screams, coming closer to Coop by his step. It's like a nightmare square we're forming. Emmy is behind the desk, and I'm next to it. Coop is standing in front of Emmy, with Adam at the doorway pointing the gun right at him. Adam, please let them go. It's me that you have issues with. These people are just innocent bystanders, okay? I'll go with you. We can go get the money and take care of everything. He laughs again, and I know that he isn't going to be reasoned with. I just need one more inch, and my purse is right there on the floor. I take a step back, hook my purse strap with my heel, and try to bring my leg up slowly where he can't see it. Luckily, we're at an angle where he can't see the bottom part of my body since he's moved closer to Coop. Adam, you don't want to do anything stupid. Let me have the gun, and we can go in the back and figure this out. You want some protection against this guy? We can do that. Come on, Adam. Let me have the gun. Coop moves just a step closer, and I use the distraction to grab the strap and pull my purse up. My gun is in my hands before he even has a second to notice I've moved. The heavy weight feels like the only lifeline I have right now. Oh, really? I don't want to do anything stupid. You idiots can't protect me from D. He will find me, and since I'm already a dead man walking, there ain't shit to stop me from, oh, I don't know, taking Blondie's head off first. It's as if the world starts only working in slow motion. Adam turns and points his gun right at Emmy's head. She gasps, but doesn't even move. Absolute terror washes over her body, and she goes statue still. I scream and go to raise my gun, but before I even have it halfway up from my hip, I hear the deafening sound of the bullet leaving the chamber, and then the slow-motion horror show keeps rolling. I watch with helpless, stone-cold dread as Coop flings his body to the side. His large frame jolts when he takes the bullet meant for Emmy's head. "'You motherfucker!' I scream and finish raising my gun. He just laughs, and before I can pop the safety and shoot— I hear another shot echo around the room. A burning like nothing I've ever felt in my life sears through my left shoulder, but I don't even falter. The sick bastard just shot my friend, and I'll be damned if anyone else here takes a bullet. It seems to take forever, but really it's only been seconds since Coop hit the floor, before I take a deep breath and fire my own weapon. When the recoil rocks me back, I lock my knees and keep my eyes trained on the sick fuck that just took my bullet between his fucking eyes. I drop the gun, and with a sob I rush toward where Coop's body is lying motionless on the black tile floor. My ears hurt from the screams that are echoing throughout the office, and it takes me a second to realize that they are coming from my own mouth. When I reach his side, I slip and fall, crashing to the floor next to him. Coop! Oh, God! Zeke Cooper, open your eyes, please! Help! Someone help us! He opens his eyes for a second, but they slip closed just as I'm pulling his heavy body into my arms. I search his body, but when I see the dark red hole right in the middle of his stomach, I know this isn't good. Emmy, come on and help me. She doesn't even move. Coop, wake up, babe, please, God. My sobs start to echo around me. I lean back, pull my tank top over my body, and press it tight against his stomach. I don't know if this is going to help, but I'm not going to stop short of trying everything. I know that they've had to hurt the shots next door. There's no damn way they didn't. Maddox, God, please. I sob, begging for the only person that can be any help now. Unless the guys in the back open that door, there is no way they can hear anything happening, but I keep trying. Coop, please, stay with me. Coop. I keep pressure against his wound, but when the blood starts coming through my shirt and coating my hands, I start to panic. Fuck. I'm not even sure how I hear Maddox screaming over my sobbing. 
but he is immediately by my side. He pulls his shirt off and puts it on top of my hand. Hold! Don't fucking move! He bends down and speaks in Coop's ear. Coop's eyes open and he tries to nod his head, but his eyes widen before a sickening wet groan comes up his throat. I watch in horror as he coughs once and a massive amount of blood comes pouring out of his mouth. I try to shift my body so that I can offer him something, anything, but my legs slip and my body almost slides, crashing down when I lose my traction. I look down and notice the amount of blood that I'm kneeling in. Maddox! I call him to come help me, but he's looking at Emmy as he barks orders into the phone. She still hasn't moved from her spot behind the desk, tears still pouring down her face, and her small body shaking with so many violent waves. I know she's about two seconds away from going into shock. Shit! I see a flash of hot pink and long blonde hair rush past me and down the hallway to the back of the building. I look up for a second to see Chelsea with her arms wrapped tightly around her belly, just shaking her head back and forth. It doesn't take long before Beck, Greg, and Axel come rushing down the hallway, followed by a frantic, crying sway. They don't waste any time springing into action. I don't move from my position and continue pressing the two soaked shirts against his solid abdomen. Maddox finishes telling the 911 operator the rest of the details, before slinging the phone across the room where it crashes against the wall. I've got it. Go get him. Greg's rough voice, thick with emotion, tells Maddox when he moves to come back to Coop. He looks torn for a second between the man that is like his brother and the woman that he's been fighting his feelings for. With a heavy sob, he picks himself off the floor and rushes over to where she is sitting. She doesn't move, but he picks her up from the chair and quickly carries her over to one of the couches. Chelsea, find me a jacket, blanket, some fucking thing now! His tone snaps her attention from Coop and she rushes back through the office. I bring my focus back to the men surrounding Coop and take in each one of their faces. They hold so much pain and grief. This is what the face of hopelessness looks like. No, 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 Coop. Coop, you stay with us. Do you hear me? I sob and scream, beg for him to be okay. When the paramedics rush in and tell me to move out of the way, I refuse at first. I'm keeping him alive. How can they think of asking me to move? It takes both Beck and Greg to pull me off of his body. When they finally roll him into the back of their rig, I collapse and let out every single scream and ounce of agony left in my body as Beck holds me tight. Axel leaves with Coop. Maddox leaves in the second ambulance with Emmy, and when they come to tell me I need to be checked out, I fight them tooth and nail. Beck finally tells them they will have to look me over while I sit in his arms. I look around the room while I hold on to Beck with everything left in my body and take in the grief-stricken faces of those that are left. Greg is standing off to the side talking with one of the cops. Another one is talking to Sway over by the couches. Chelsea, having just finished giving her statement— comes to stand next to where Beck is rocking me on the floor. I remember hearing Beck tell the officers that they would have to follow us over to the hospital before they would get the rest of our statements. Greg finishes up and helps Beck stand from the floor so that he can keep his arms around me. I don't realize until we are on the way to the hospital that the reason he couldn't stand on his own is because we had been sitting in the middle of the slippery, dark red pool of blood that Coop's body had left behind. Chapter 27 Beck Three hours. Three painful hours. That's how long we've been sitting here, waiting for the closed door to finally open, waiting for answers and praying for a miracle. When I look at the faces of the people around me, I know that we all know how grim this looks. We arrived at the hospital to find Axel in the waiting room. Maddox hasn't left Emmy's side since he carried her into the ambulance back at the office. He's currently sitting in one of the stiff waiting room chairs with her small body curled in his arms. Dee moves her head off my chest long enough to give her statement to the police. Listening to her play back the events that led us to where we are right now does nothing to ease the gut-burning dread that is eating away inside me. Coop was shot right under our fucking noses, and because we had been stuck on some stupid fucking conference call with some stupid fucking city official that wanted us to check on his wife... We hadn't been there. Right now, Coop is fighting for his life, and I can't help but think this is our fault. The only reason we shut that door is because we couldn't let the girls hear the city official on the phone. 
Eight minutes later, we have Sway throwing the door open, screaming for us to get to the front. Eight minutes is all it took for our backs to be turned long enough, and the unthinkable happened. Right under our noses. I can't even let my mind think about how close I came to losing D again. Every single time my mind tries to go down that path, I feel as if my heart is being torn from my chest. I shift her and pull her still form closer to my chest. I need to feel that she is alive and right here with me. I see Chelsea shift, her arms still wrapped around her stomach and her pale face still dripping with the occasional tear. Chelsea? I wait for her to look at me before continuing. Are you okay? She jumps slightly before her body stills and her tears pick up. Shit, I don't want to upset her more. Chels? She just looks at me, with her eyes vacant, and her head slowly shakes back and forth. I sigh and shift one of my arms from Dee's body. I feel her wiggle closer to make up for the loss of my arm before settling in again. I motion for Chelsea to come over. She doesn't waste a second rushing across the room and dropping into the chair next to us. I wrap my arm around her shoulder and pull her into my chest. She wraps her arm around both Dee and me and lets out the emotions she's obviously been holding in tight. Dee reaches out and hugs her, offering her some of the strength she has left. We sit here like this for what feels like forever before the door opens. We all stiffen, waiting to see who will be walking through that door. I've settled back in my seat when Izzy and Melissa come in. Izzy rushes right into Axel's arms. He drops his face into her neck, and I watch his shoulders shake. He's held it in, and I have no idea how. The only thing keeping me from breaking down is knowing that I need to stay strong for D right now. Melissa walks as fast as her belly will allow, and Greg meets her halfway. Like Axel, he holds his wife close, and they just stand there. None of us knows what else to do but keep praying and try our hardest to keep our shit together. Chelsea pulls away after another thirty minutes of crying and settles back against her chair. I keep my arm around her shoulder, hoping that what little comfort I can offer helps whatever she's fighting. Dee lifts off my chest and turns her red-rimmed eyes my way. I try to give her a smile, but she just shakes her head. Don't think you have to act a certain way for me, Beck. Let me be your rock. Let me be there for you, because, baby, I know you're hurting right now, and I'm here. Her words rock me straight down to the floor. I've been so worried that if I let my grief show, it might trigger something in her. For about two seconds, I think about how fucking proud I am that in the middle of tragedy, my D is back and stronger than ever. Those two seconds end, and all of the fear, pain, and distress I've been feeling come rushing to the surface. She notices my break, winds her arms around my neck, and pulls me into her body. I give myself a few minutes to let it out before I take a few deep, calming breaths and pull back. She gives me a wobbly smile and a small kiss against my lips. Someone needs to call Ash, Greg rumbles from where he and Melissa have taken a seat across from us. I look over where Chelsea is stiffened again before looking back at Greg. Yeah, you want me to do it? He shakes his head at me before kissing Melissa, rubbing her belly, and taking off to the corner of the room so he can have some privacy to make one hell of a hard call. I keep my eyes on Greg the whole time he's on the phone. His body language is telling me enough. Ash is flipping out, and Greg is doing his best to stay calm. Five minutes later, he closes the phone and turns back to the room. I'm sure that my eyes are just as wet as his are right now. Ash is luckily about 45 minutes outside of Atlanta. My guess is that door will be experiencing one hell of a tornado in about 15 minutes, though. I nod and we all settle back in. Chelsea lets out a sob before rushing from her chair and into the connecting bathroom. What's that about? I whisper to Dee. I'm not sure. She's been acting really weird ever since her and Coop... Yeah, it's just been weird. I don't say anything, because I'm not exactly sure what to make of this now. I know for a fact that Coop hasn't hooked back up with Chelsea. Last time I talked to him, he told me that it was just that once, and even Chelsea had agreed that it shouldn't happen again. Either way, I can't worry about that shit right now. Twenty minutes is all it takes for the door to slam against the wall, and a six-foot-five-inch carbon copy of Zeke Cooper to rush into the room. Asher Cooper, Zeke's older brother by ten months, and the only family he has left. I feel Dee gasp when she realizes just who Ash is. Holy shit, she whispers. 
Any news? His voice, deeper and grittier than Coop's, booms through the room. He's not addressing anyone in particular. He's just as desperate as we are for some answers. Nothing yet. Maddox breaks his silence to answer him. Ash? Axel gets up and pulls him in for a hug. They have a few words before Asher pulls away, and looks over the room before his eyes settle on me. I've always been closer with Coop than the other guys have, so I know before he starts walking that he's headed to me. Asher walks over and sits next to me in the seat that Chelsea vacated. Please tell me what happened, Beck. I got just enough to stop my fucking heart before I jumped in the truck and headed this way. I give him a rundown on what happened, pausing to let D fill in the blanks that I didn't know, and watch as the hope Asher had when he walked in the door disappears. Don't fucking bullshit me, Beck. How bad is it? His eyes, darker than Coop's light blue, are begging me to tell him it's just something minor. It's bad, Ash. It's real bad. He nods his head and leans back. I watch him pull it together and harden his heart, preparing for the worst. Not even a minute later, Chelsea finally comes out of the bathroom, and she just stands there staring at Asher, as if she's just seen a ghost. All of the color, or what little is left, drains from her face, and a shaky hand slaps against her mouth. What the fuck? Asher grunts against me. Chels? Dee's soft voice snaps her out of the shocked day she's in, and her eyes bounce between Dee and Asher. Who, who are you? She asks, with a hint of fear in her voice. Asher Cooper, who are you? She doesn't even answer. I can hear her gag before she runs back into the bathroom where the sounds of her heaving come through the door. I've got it, Dee whispers and climbs out of my lap for the first time since we arrived over five hours ago. I stretch my legs while she shuts herself in the bathroom with Chelsea. Not much that I can do about chick problems when the chick isn't mine. It takes Dee a while to get Chelsea out of the bathroom. She looks horrible and keeps sneaking glances at Asher. Dee takes one look into my eyes, and I know instantly that whatever the hell is going on with Chelsea is a lot bigger than a girl hung up on an ex-lover. She settles Chelsea into a chair on the other side of me and climbs back into my lap. Before she puts her head back down, she just looks into my eyes. I see what she's saying. We'll talk later, and I need to be prepared for this one. I nod my head and give her a kiss before she lays her head back down. Dee's back in my arms and we sit here, continuing to wait. I've been staring at the white bandage peeking out of the sleeve of the shirt she threw on before leaving the office. My mind can't wrap around the fact that, if it had just been a few inches in the other direction, she wouldn't be sitting with me. I close my eyes when the images of her bleeding out on the floor become too much. As it is, I don't think I will ever forget the picture of Coop lying there. D covered in more blood than the floor, working desperately to stop the blood flowing from his body. I open my eyes when the images become too much, and loosen my tight hold on D when I hear her soft grunt. Shit. It takes every fiber in my body to turn the thoughts in my head back into the hopeful prayers that I've been repeating since we left the office. Another two hours pass before the doctor finally comes to find us. His face is void of emotion when he addresses the room and asks for Zachariah Cooper's family. Asher stands and walks over to the doctor with his back straight and his head high. The doctor speaks in low tones, but when Asher's body starts heaving and his head shakes rapidly, my heart sinks. I look over at the rest of my brothers as the realization of what news has just been delivered sinks in. Ash lets out a noise so painful that if my heart hadn't already split in two, it surely would have then. D slides off my lap without a word, and I stand, walking over to where the doctor is still speaking. Did everything we could, but there was just too much damage. And just like that, Ash's legs lose the power to hold him up, and I grab on as he unleashes his grief. I look over his head and meet Dee's eyes. Her tears are coming fast and fierce, but she gives me a weak smile so that I know she is holding it together. There isn't a single person in this room that hasn't been touched by Coop in one way or another. None of us is able to hold in the pain that we are feeling, knowing that he didn't make it. Zachariah Zeke Cooper died a hero. He was one of my best friends, my brother, and he died saving the life of not only my woman, but Emmy as well. Chapter 28 D. 
Cooper's been gone for four days now. Four days since I sat in the hospital and watched the strongest men I know break down. And it's been four days since Chelsea told me what's been going on with her. Pregnant. She's pregnant. And Coop will never know that he's going to be a father. That one time they shared may have been mutually no strings. But now he's gone. And there isn't anything we can do to change that. I know she's having a hard time with things. She and Coop might not have had any feelings for each other, but that doesn't change the fact that there is a baby coming into this world that will never know his or her father. I think the hardest part for her right now is knowing that she never had a chance to even tell him. I take a deep breath and continue to apply my makeup. Beck's already dressed in his dress blues, and if it was for any other occasion, I might be able to appreciate how good-looking he is. I've chosen a simple, form-fitting black dress. The short, cropped sleeves cover enough of my nasty, healing wound from where the bullet grazed my arm. I grab a pair of black, four-inch heels before walking down the stairs and meeting Beck in the kitchen. I watch his back as he moves about fixing a cup of coffee. He's holding his body tight, and I know that today is costing him emotionally. After fixing his cup, he turns— picks up his white barracks cover and leans back against the counter, just looking at his hat. I walk over and take his face in my hands. I don't give him words. Right now he doesn't need them. I pull his head down and place a soft kiss against his lips. When I drop back down on my heels, I keep my palms against his cheeks. His eyes are closed, but a single tear spills from the corner and rolls onto my fingers— my heart is breaking for him right now, and I have no idea how to take some of the pain away. I love you, I remind him, just as I have every single night for the last four days. And I love you. His voice is thick with emotion, but he looks like he's holding it together a little better than he was two minutes ago. Chelsea comes down about ten minutes later dressed in a black dress similar to mine. She looks a little better than she did yesterday— and I had to take that as a mark on the positive side of things. She gives me a small smile before sitting down to wait until the limo gets here to take us to the funeral home. Since Izzy and Melissa are sharing a sitter for the kids, we're going to be the last stop before heading out. Deep breath in. Stay strong. I keep repeating those five words over and over. For the most part, I'm holding it together better than I ever expected. The night we got home from the hospital... I had to put a call into Dr. Maxwell's private cell. After explaining what happened, she was more than happy to help me with my issues over the phone. It took about an hour, but when I hung up the phone with her, I realized that I just lived through something terrible and wasn't shutting down. I knew what I needed to do without having someone remind me. I saw myself being pulled in by those dark thoughts and fears and made the call that I needed to make. We discussed the warning signs that I should look for, but she seemed pretty positive that I was holding myself together the best way I could. She also stressed that I let Beck know that if he needs to talk, her door would be open for him. We talked about it last night, and he agreed that he would go speak with her. Watching him suffer in his grief and knowing that he was blaming himself for what happened had me worried. I never thought I would see the day when I would be able to repay all of the things he's done for me in the past— or I should say, start to repay him. The service for Coop was one of the most emotional things I'd ever experienced. All of the boys wore their dress blues, and they looked breathtaking. I wasn't even shocked to see Asher sitting front and center in a uniform of his own. All of the guys took their seats next to Asher, and all five of Coop's brothers sat stoically. They didn't flinch when the rifles went off, not a twitch in their faces when the bugle started playing. And when Asher was presented with a flag that had been draped over Coop's casket, they each kept their faces forward and eyes on Coop. They didn't move until the last person had walked away from the gravesite. It wasn't until Izzy grabbed my hand to draw my attention across the graveyard that I watched those strong men crack a little. I hadn't seen Sway since that day— I knew that he had watched the kids for Izzy and Melissa when they came to the hospital, and that he closed the salon for the last two days out of respect for Coop. Watching Sway walk across the grass, 
Weaving to avoid stepping on any markers is almost too much. Gone is his normal flamboyant garb, and in its place is a perfectly tailored black suit. His trademark blonde wig is gone, and his normal hair, which I have never seen before, is buzzed close to his scalp. There is nothing about this version of Sway that I have ever seen before. He did this for Coop. I know he waited for the service to end and the crowd to clear before he paid his respects. Melissa reaches over and takes my other hand, and we sit here waiting to see what happens next. From where we are, we have the perfect view of the scene playing out. All five of the men watch as Sway walks up to the casket and sets a single mason jar on top. It has a beautiful red, white, and blue ribbon tied around the top, and when my eyes take in the contents, a sob bubbles out before I can stop it. He presses his hand against the wood next to the gold, glitter-filled jar and dips his head. He takes a few minutes before he pats the top twice and stands back. At this point, all of us are sobbing uncontrollably, but what is most shocking to me is that all five of the men across the way have finally cracked. Obviously, Coop had filled his brother in at some point about the whole glitter prank, because even his eyes are shining despite the small smile playing his lips. These big, strong, proud men aren't even trying to stop the tears that are falling as they look at Sway with small smiles. Sway dips his head before he walks back off in the direction he came. His shoulders are bent, and his soft cries trail behind him. He makes his way to his car and drives off. There isn't a single dry eye left as we all take in the beautiful glass jar full of the simmering of happiness. Chapter 29 D. It's been two weeks since we said goodbye to Coop. Some days are harder than others are, but things are slowly starting to pick back up to normal. Asher has taken up the other guest room at Bex, and between him and Chelsea, things are a bit awkward. She hasn't told anyone other than me about the baby, and I respect her wishes that I keep it to myself, but that doesn't mean I feel good about it. Asher should know that there is a part of his brother that will live on, and for better or worse, Chelsea needs to let him in her life so that her child will know a part of their father. Beck has been to speak with Dr. Maxwell three times now, and I can tell it's really helping. We have spent almost every night lying awake in each other's arms just talking. I feel closer to him than I ever have before. He's been here for me when I wake up in a cold sweat, when the events of that day play out in my dreams. His soft words and warm embrace are the only things that I want when those dark moments come back. There are times when I catch him staring off into space, and I know those are the times when he's thinking about Coop. No one really knows how to completely move forward from this. Whenever the group is all together, there's always that moment when someone checks the door, waiting for Coop to come barging through with some hilarious comment. We can't stop wishing that we could just see his blue eyes twinkling with humor one more time. Grief is such a bastard. Asher's decided to stick around for a while. I know he's taking his brother's death the hardest out of all of us. There have been a few nights when he's come home drunk out of his mind and stumbled into his room. The sound of his agony echoing through the walls is overwhelming, and I have no idea how to ease his pain. One thing's for sure, he's not healing, and at this point, I'm not sure he wants to. Today we're moving Chelsea into my apartment. The one thing that Coop's death has driven home is that tomorrow is never promised, and there should never be an excuse to not live your life to the fullest. No regrets and no fear of the unknown. So today, Chelsea will start a new chapter of her life in Georgia, and I will start mine with the man I love. Are you sure you don't want to stay another night, Chels? You know you're always welcome here. She smiles weakly, but continues to pack up the last of her clothes. She doesn't have much. Just the two suitcases of clothes she brought down, and a box of things that she didn't want to leave behind. No, I need to be alone right now. I need to figure out where I go from here. Are you okay? I know we've talked about it, but how are you dealing with all of this? I sit down on the bed and still her hands when she goes to pack some more. 
I know she's just trying to avoid this conversation that we need to have. I love that you're worried about me, Dee, but I'm really okay. I just wish I would have had a chance to tell him, you know? We didn't have that kind of relationship, but that doesn't change the fact that he would have been a great father. She sits down next to me and fidgets with the shirt in her hands. I'll make sure that our child knows who their father was and that he died a hero. Every day, Dee. I have to choke back the emotions that threaten to sneak past the lump in my throat. Can't I miss him? I think you need to talk to Asher. He's spiraling out of control over this, and he needs something to hold on to. Something that will keep him pushing forward. This little baby will be a part of his brother, his nephew or niece. He needs to know that there is something positive. She doesn't speak for a while, and right when I'm ready to just give up on my newest round of convinced Chelsea, she shifts on the bed. I will. Let me get settled in the apartment, and then I'll have him over one night. I think it's something that needs to be done away from everyone else. We continue to pack the rest of the clothes and head out. Asher's door is shut tight, but I know he's in there. He came in around four this morning and hasn't come out since. I checked on him around breakfast time, but he was passed out. His room had the unpleasant stench of stale smoke, booze, and cheap sex. I pulled his shoes off and covered him with a blanket before leaving his room. Beck is waiting outside for us when we finally come down. He takes my breath away every time I see him. Plain and simple, he is perfect. He's wearing cargo shorts and a USMC T-shirt. His University of Georgia ball cap has his eyes shaded, but I know he's looking right at me. I walk over to Chelsea's car and throw the bag that I'm carrying in the trunk. She doesn't waste time with hellos or goodbyes, just drops her bag in, jumps in the driver's seat, and takes off. Where are you headed, handsome? His crooked smile has my panties on fire. Nowhere. Wait on Maddox. Apparently some shit went down with Emmy last night. He drops his eyes, but not before I see how worried he is. Truth is, we've all been worried about her. She hasn't spoken to anyone, and not for our lack of trying. She spent the whole time at the hospital in Maddox's arms. But when we went to leave, she crawled out of his lap and walked over to Melissa. She and Melissa have always been the closest out of us girls, but I'm still surprised she left Maddox. Even at Coop's funeral, she didn't speak to anyone. She stood next to Melissa and never took her eyes from the casket. What's going on? Please don't keep it from me because you think I can't handle it. Me and you now, Beck. I need you just as much as you need me, so don't lock me out because you're worried about how I'll handle things. I'm stronger today because of you, so let me help you when you need me. He doesn't say anything for a beat, but lets out a rushed breath, looking away before turning back to me. She's gone. He went over to check on her and she was gone. It looks like she left in a hurry, but she did take the time to leave a note. He didn't tell me the details about what she said, but he's on his way over so we can figure out what to do next. What? The whole time he was talking, my mind kept wondering and twirling about what he was really saying. Emmy is gone? There's no way. She wouldn't leave her family. This is why I didn't want to say anything. I know you're going to get upset about this, Dee. Just trust us to take care of everything, okay? He takes me in his arms and I breathe in his woodsy scent and try not to panic thinking about Emmy out there alone and scared. You have to find her, Beck. You just have to. We will. I promise you. We will find her. I smile weakly and go to leave when his voice stops me short of my car. Hey, let me get Ash and let him go with you. I would feel a lot better about you running around town if you had him with you. I would go myself, but this needs to be handled. Chelsea is going to flip when I show up with Asher, but I just nod my head and wait for him to run up to wake the bear. Ten minutes later, a frowning Beck and a pissed-off Asher come walking out. He doesn't say a single word on the fifteen-minute ride to the apartment. Hell, I'm pretty sure he passed out the second I started driving. After leaving Beck, I make my way over to the apartment to help Chelsea get unpacked. It doesn't take long to get her settled in, and in reality, I'm not sure she even really needed me there. All the furniture is staying, and we have already moved all of my clothing and personal items over to Beck's, my new home. Ash throws himself on the couch the second we walked in the door. Chelsea looks horrified that he's here. 
but when his light snoring starts echoing around the room, she calms down. Just being tired makes it easy to just do as little as possible, but we still manage to get a few hours of work in before we call it quits for the day. Before I leave the spare bedroom that I've had set up as an office, I turn and address a giant elephant that's currently passed down on the couch. Think about what I said, okay? I give her a quick hug, hoping that she will at least think about it. I just know that deep down Asher needs this. I don't know him well enough to know for sure, but I know for me, knowing that Coop is still around in any way helps the pain. I promise I'll think about it. Will you, will you let me know how he's doing? Just keep me updated. She doesn't meet my eyes, which isn't like her at all. Sure thing, and you call if you need anything. Maddox is just a few floors up, so if you get freaked or anything, just call him. I know he comes across all broody and moody, but he's one of the best to have by your side. I can tell she isn't in the mood for me to stick around, so after a quick goodbye, I shake Ash awake and we head out. Even though I didn't live here that long, it's still hard to leave the one place that I've thought of as my sanctuary. I wave at the doorman and head out to my car, grabbing my phone to call Beck before I head home. Home. My home with Beck. As in, my house that I share with the man I love. I've got the biggest smile on my face when he picks up. Asher just drops into the passenger seat and leans his head against the window, still silent. Hey, he growls into the phone. I shiver when I hear his voice. There really is no way to describe how that man sets me on fire. Hey, you. I'm leaving the apartment now. I'm going to stop at the store before I head home. I figured I'd make that stuffed chicken that you love so much for dinner tonight, and I have a few things to pick up anyway. Is there anything you want me to grab? No, Wildcat. All I need is you. Is Maddox still over? Actually, we're not there. He needed me to check something on the computers at the office, so I ran down here real quick. I should be right behind you after I finish with all this. He sounds so stressed. With everything he's been dealing with, I'm not surprised. Not only losing Coop, but now Emmy? Work, worrying about me, and not knowing who the hell attacked me is eating him hard. We haven't heard anything since I shot Adam. For all we know, that asshole is done with us. But Beck won't let it go. Emmy? I ask, because really there isn't any need to say anything else. He knows I'm going to worry about her. That's why he didn't want me to know. Yeah, Emmy. I'll fill you in later. But according to her letter, she's not coming back. She's going to stay with a friend of some shit in Florida. There's more, but I'll tell you when I get home. There's that word again. Home. God, that feels good. Promise me that you'll tell me back. I need to know what's going on, or I'll never stop worrying about her. I know. I didn't mean to keep it from you earlier. I just worry about you, Dee. You can't blame me there. With all this shit swirling around, I just need to protect you. I can't explain it any better than that. I need to protect you, even if it's from your own mind. How can I be upset when he puts it like that? I understand I do, but I'm a lot stronger than you think. I love you for wanting to make sure that I'm okay. Just don't shut me out. If things start to get too much, I promise to let you know. Yeah, you sure are. Fuck, I'm so proud of you. I can hear the smile in his voice, and it matches the one on my face. I never thought it would feel so good to let me be free from all the webs I was trapped in. Being loved by John Beckett is the best feeling in the world. We finish up our call, and I pull out of the parking garage. With a smile on my face, I hurry to finish my errands so I can get home and into my man's arms. Chapter 30 D. Ash? I'm half tempted to leave his ass sitting in my car. Hell, I've been sitting here for the last ten minutes attempting to get him up. If it weren't for the awkward angle that his head has fallen, I would just leave his ass here. While that and I'm pretty sure he still smells like a bar and sex. Not a pleasant combination when you're stuck in a car together. Asher! There. I see a twitch this time. Seriously! I sigh in frustration. Asher James Cooper, wake the hell up and get out of my car! He peeks one dark blue eye open and just glares at me. Please? I whine. His lips twitch slightly and I let out the breath I'm holding. For the first time in two weeks, 
His lips have tipped up from the frown that is taking up a permanent residence on his handsome face. Next time you don't have to scream so loud. He opens the door and unfolds his large body from my car. I expect him to just start trudging up the path to the front door, but he turns and walks to the truck. He stands there for a few minutes, looking around. Even in his hangover and grief, he still seems to be keeping alert, or at least he's trying to. I shake my head and climb out, walk around the car and reach to pull the groceries from the trunk. Asher's large paw crosses in front of me and just scoops the massive amounts of groceries up. I watch him walk into the house, and I hear the sounds of him deactivating the alarm, before I realize he has left me one bag in the milk. Seriously? That man was passed out two seconds ago, and now he's heaving my massive amounts of groceries like it's nothing. Not even attempting to understand how the hell he's managing, I start to walk up the path. Even with the small load that he left for me to carry, I still have my arms full between my purse, briefcase, and groceries— my phone starts ringing in my back pocket as I walk over the threshold and into the house. Maybe if I hadn't have been so distracted listening to Love's Sex Magic, the ringtone Beck set for when he calls, I might have noticed how still the house is. I don't even have two feet inside the house when I stop dead. Everything I am carrying falls to the floor. I feel the milk explode and splash against my legs, but I can't move. I just stand here looking into the ice-cold eyes of the man who beat me and then left me for dead. I should be worried about myself right now, but the only thing I can think of is Asher. He came in before me. He should be right here. Even knowing he isn't anywhere near fighting form, he should be right here. Hello, Denise. It was so sweet of you to leave the bodyguard detail to just the drunk for once. You, my dear, are a hard woman to get alone these days. He laughs, but he sounds so mechanical, like he isn't used to ever laughing, so he doesn't know how to make it believable. I stand there, gaping at him, struggling to battle the talons of fear trying to sink into my skin and keeping me frozen in place. When he moves to take a step towards me, I finally snap out of my daze. No, just fucking no. I'm so sick of everyone trying to take my happiness from me. This is going to end now, no matter what. Oh, little D. I had so hoped you would behave like the last time we were together. I jump when he moves to grab me again, and when he slips on the milk spilt all over the floor, I take off through the foyer and down the hall. I look in the doorways that I pass before hitting the living room. No Asher in sight. It isn't until I skid into the kitchen that I see him on the floor in front of the fridge. I use the second it takes to make sure his chest is rising to rip my heels off and move behind the breakfast bar. I stand there with both my heels in my hand and wait, staring at the hallway that I can hear him coming down. D, where'd you go, little girl? God damn it, even his voice is terrifying. You had to be a stupid cunt about this, didn't you? He walks into the kitchen, and I stand in front of Asher's prone form, guarding him with all I had time to grab, my four-inch heels. I chance to look at the knife block, but it's too far for me to reach without having this fucknut get to me. What do you want? I don't have your money, you sick fuck! Adam is gone, so what? I'm spitting mad, and thankfully the fear I first felt is gone. I'm not letting him win. I hear Asher groan, but I don't look down. It's only going to take a second of me taking my focus off of this guy before I lose my advantage. He stands before me with his face hard and his hands clenched. Once again he's dressed in all black, but this time he's not hiding his face. It's quite shocking how handsome he is. His skin is tan, hair thick and black, and those eyes... His eyes are not what you see in a man you would approach at the bar. Instead, his eyes reflect the soul of the devil. I shiver just thinking about all the evil swimming in those pale blue depths. He starts to step closer to me. But before he can complete the move, I scream and chuck one of my shoes at him, nailing him right in the middle of his forehead. If I weren't so worried about his reaction, I would laugh at the picture it made. My bright yellow shoe sails across the room, the heel hits his head and snaps off from the rest of the shoe with the force of my throw. You bitch! If I didn't think it would cause more trouble than it's worth, I would snap your fucking neck in two for that shit. He wipes the blood running down into his eyes away before narrowing them at me. Consider that your last warning. Don't fuck with me. I laugh. Really, don't fuck with him? Not only have his own hands hurt me, but because of the shit he threw into my lap, we lost Coop. I plan on fucking with him hard. 
His eyes narrow even further, and he goes to take another step, but I fling my other shoe at him. He ducks easily, but before I can move, he lunges and grabs me by my waist. I try to fight, but his strength makes it impossible. I'm just not strong enough. No matter how much I struggle, he swings me around until my back is pressed against his hard chest. I start panting when I realize he has a control now. You little bitch, he growls, and I close my eyes tight, trying to keep my body from shutting down. I'm going to say what I came to tell you, and then I'm going to have some fun. No one makes me fucking bleed without paying the price. I try to get free, but he still has his arms wrapped tightly around my body, pinning my arms to my sides so that I couldn't get an inch if I wanted to. I attempt to kick my legs, but he backs his body against the wall for support and folds one of his legs over both of mine. Fuck! Listen closely and make sure you actually hear what I have to say. My employer is very pleased that you took care of the whole Adam situation, saved us the trouble of putting a bullet through his head. Unfortunately, that still leaves the unsettled debt. But he's willing to take the fact that you so kindly sacrificed one of your own in place of a monetary payment. Such a shame about your little friend. But the blood he spilled is good enough for my boss. One less person digging in his business. Now, here's your little warning. Call off your mutts before someone else gets hurt. I know you would hate to see your boyfriend with bullet holes through his body. Hmm? His warm breath against my neck makes me gag. My skin crawls where he's caressing my neck. When he keeps talking about Coop, talking about his life as if it meant nothing, I want to kill him. If he wanted me to submit, he's going to be sadly mistaken. Every word out of his mouth fuels the rage burning inside of me. Do you understand, little bitch? His hand tightens against my neck when I take too long to answer him, and for once there is not an ounce of fear. Yes, I ground out the word, my chest heaving and my mouth watering to fight. Perfect. Now let's have some fun. He lightens his hold. I have the brief flash of hope until I feel his hand painfully cup my crotch. That's all it takes for my body to go rock solid and the fear to invade again. It's like Brandon all over again. Did the little bitch decide to stop playing so hard to get? Going to take it like a good whore? He brings his hand up and grips my waistband, before giving a hard tug and tossing my body on the floor. The biting pain of my head hitting something solid seems to clear the fear that has begun to fog my mind. I look up at this nameless man, and all the things I wish I'd done to Brandon come rushing to the surface. No, not this time! I rush to my feet and charge at him. My nails scratch and claw at his face. My feet, legs, knees, anything that can make purchase slam into his body. He grunts and blocks what he can, but I have the benefit of catching him unexpectedly. He never thought I would fight, but I have too much to lose to lie down and let him win. You motherfucking fucker! I start moving as quick and as powerfully as I can, slamming into him with every limb. By the time he finally manages to push me roughly off of him, I'm breathing heavy and covered in blood. His blood. I let a smile curve my lips up when I think about how good it feels to fight. I'm not just fighting for Asher's life and my own. No, I'm fighting for everything this man and his employer have taken from us. This is for Coop. That's the last thing to filter through my rage before I pick myself up and throw my body against him again. He manages a few hits, but he has nothing against me now. I have too much to lose and too much keeping me fighting. My violent fury is almost a living, breathing thing. I push hard against his chest kick up and slam my foot into his crotch and watch with satisfaction when he crashes against the floor. Right when I'm about to kick again and collide with his head, I'm jerked back. I can't focus around the bloodthirst. I want to kill that fucker with my own hands. Panting roughly, I finally place the scent that is surrounding me. Beck. My Beck is here. I've got you, Wildcat. And just like that, I sag against him, and the fight drains from my body. Chapter 31 Beck There are no words to describe how I feel when I walk up to my house and see the door wide open, Dee's stuff mixed with a pool of milk, and the sounds of a fight coming from inside my house. I pull my gun from the holster at my side and start to step over the mess at my front door. 
For as long as I live, I will never forget rushing through my house and finding my wildcat fighting with everything that she has in her against a man almost twice her size. I don't even know what she's saying. It's all coming out in garbled, unrecognizable words. Before I can reach her, she brings her leg back and slams his crotch with one hell of a kick. She goes to kick him again, but I hook her by her waist and pull her to my body. The sense of relief I feel when her body is next to mine is unimaginable. She is safe. She is fighting. And I'm going to kill this motherfucker. I've got you, Wildcat. Her body relaxes against mine. The adrenaline, the fight, falls from her body. I've got you, I whisper again. Oh, God, she sobs. Asher. She pulls herself from my hold, and I watch her run behind the bar and drop to the floor. I don't have time to ask her if he's okay, because I see this motherfucker that was trying to hurt my woman start to stand. I don't fucking think so. I don't move my gun from his head when I call over my shoulder for Dee to call 911. Who the fuck are you? He doesn't move a muscle. Nothing, but his eyes narrow. I won't ask you again. You came into my house, you touched my woman, and I don't even know what the hell you did to my friend. It won't be hard to put a goddamn bullet through your fucking skull and work that in my favor, so do not fucking try me. Who. Are. You. His smile grows before he speaks. Nico Slater. Your woman is fucking delicious. He licks his lips, and I don't even have to think twice. I let off a round and smile when he is thrown back with the force of the bullet slamming into his shoulder. Don't fuck with me. I walk over to his withering body and stand over him. Who do you work for? His lips press tightly and he looks away with a grimace. Answer me! He doesn't say a word, so I bring my booted foot up and press against his bleeding shoulder. The howl he lets out in pain brings a smile to my face. I lean down and press my gun against his forehead. Who do you work for? With each word I speak, I tap his head with the barrel of my gun. He might be a tough little shit, but there isn't anything more terrifying than having a loaded gun pointed at your head. Dominic Murphy. The fuck, he says? You're kidding. He shakes his head and groans when I press harder against his shoulder. Dom Murphy has been on our radar since we set up core security. It's no secret that he has his hands in just about everything dirty that can be found in the southeast. Especially Atlanta, but there has never been one single thread to connect him to anything. He's essentially a ghost with little piss ants running the show for him while he sits back like a king. You might as well kill me. I'm as good as dead anyway. I wouldn't give you the satisfaction, you sick fuck. I pull my empty hand back and land a punch to his temple that has his eyes rolling back in his head, out like a light. Pushing my gun back into my holster, I stalk to where Dee is sitting on the floor with Asher's head in her lap. She's just running her hand through his hair and whispering softly to him. His eyes aren't open, but I can tell he's awake. One second, baby. I rush out of the kitchen to the garage, grab the rope off one of the shelves, and make quick work getting back inside to tightly secure this fucker Nico. He doesn't even flinch when I throw his bound body against the wall. Turning, I rush back to Dee's side. Are you okay? I check her over, making sure there isn't anything pressing. I'm fine, I'm fine. She looks up, and when I meet her eyes, I realize that she's right. She's obviously shaken up, but there isn't anything else behind her eyes other than relief. I'm really okay, Beck. A little scared. A whole lot shaken up, but I wasn't going to let that asshole win. You did good. Damn good. Fuck, Dee, I think you took ten years off my life when I came in and saw you going head-to-head -head with that guy. Asher makes a noise and opens his eyes. Would you two shut up? My head hurts. I'm never drinking again. It doesn't take long before the sounds of sirens start to echo through the air. Asher's already standing and threatening to kill Nico, who is still passed out against the wall. That asshole sucker punched me. Didn't even have the balls to take me out like a man. No, he just waited until I had my back turned and got me. Let me at him. At one point, I have to push him out of the room because he won't stop barking at the officers to turn around and let him finish what was started. Calm down, Ash. He doesn't deserve a quick death. Let him get his ass in prison and make some big dick Don happy to have a new little bitch. His eyes heat, and the wickedness that is usually present is back with a blinding force. For the first time since Coop's death, I can see a little of the old Asher coming back. 
It's not going to be an easy battle, but he's going to be all right. It takes a while to finish answering all the questions, but with D tucked to my side, unharmed, we settle in. The detectives don't even bat an eye when I explain why Nico has a bullet fired from my gun in his shoulder. However, when they find out that D is the reason he looks like he just got the shit beat out of him, there isn't a single person that doesn't smile at that. Nico Slater has warrants out for his arrest in four surrounding states. He's a known drug dealer, a suspected enforcer, and wanted for the murders of numerous individuals. He's been a ghost to the authorities for the last three years, and there is no doubt in my mind that he will be going away for a long time. When D repeats his message to the detective, the energy in the room goes electric. I don't have to look to know exactly why. I can hear Asher panting, his emotions almost too much to control. Luckily, we now have the name of the motherfucker who put all of this in motion. And if I know Asher Cooper as well as I think I do, there isn't going to be anything that can stop him from avenging his brother's death. Six hours later, the house is empty of all emergency responders, the milk cleaned from the entryway, and all other messes are gone. The house once again looks like it did before the hellish afternoon. The only difference is that the heavy feeling of grief and heartache is starting to thin. Don't get me wrong. I miss Coop more and more every day, but knowing that we're one step closer to bringing those responsible down makes that pain just slightly more bearable. For once, Asher isn't passed out drunk, but he's locked in my office looking up everything he can on Dominic Murphy. I'm sure the day will come when we have to fight again, but for today, for once in the last few months, the good guys win. After shutting the house down, I make my way upstairs with one thought in mind taking my woman in my arms and reminding her just how much I love her. It's been a long damn road, but the woman waiting for me in our bedroom doesn't hold a single thread of those ropes that have been holding her back and tying her down. No, not my wildcat. She's back, and she's finally, fucking finally, mine. Epilogue D one month later. I had my last appointment with Dr. Maxwell today. It feels beyond liberating to know that I have not only hit rock bottom, but also fought to overcome. Even with all the struggles along the way, I'm finally in control of my own happiness. No, I haven't just overcome. I'm flying higher than I ever thought possible. I've embraced the love I never thought existed— and I've conquered each and every roadblock that has held me back. Things with Izzy and Greg didn't immediately go back to normal. They both held some guilt about everything that happened to me. I kept telling them that they shouldn't feel guilty about something they didn't know about. I didn't want them to know, so I played the part to make sure that they didn't. Things lately have been perfect. We're back to the friendship that we had from day one. Not everything is perfect, though. Chelsea has finally agreed to tell Asher. Since Asher started looking into Dominic Murphy, he's been channeling all of his pain over losing Coop into a new unhealthy obsession. We all want the people that are responsible for Coop's death to be dealt with, but Asher isn't able to do anything else. He eats, sleeps, and breathes vengeance, and I know I'm not the only one that's worried about how he's coping with things. Or not coping— so after a long talk with Chelsea, she has decided that maybe if he knows about her pregnancy, he will be able to focus on the positive things left from Coop. It's a stretch, but at this point it's all we have. They've grown closer over the last few weeks. Since selling the North Carolina branch, I've had a lot of my time freed up. I have a few more people here and taken a step back to a less active role. Chelsea, having her time cut in half as well, has taken to helping Asher whenever possible— I promised Beck that I won't stick my nose in their business, so I can only hope she knows what she's doing, and pray she doesn't get hurt in the end. Coop being gone is something that we notice more and more every day. It's hard to fill the void that a personality as strong as his used to fill. I know for a fact that as long as I live, there will never be another person like Zeke Cooper. The guys have had a photo of Coop in all his big grinning glory framed, and it is one of the main focal points when you walk into core security— is pure coop, big smiling, and the twinkle of mischief shining from his beautiful blue eyes. Underneath the picture, a simple quote is engraved into the frame, Tomorrow is never a guarantee. Live life to the fullest, and never stop smiling. 
He was taken from us before we were ready, but he lived his life unapologetically full, and I know somewhere up there he's flirting with angels and watching over each one of us. The only part of the last six weeks that's unsettled is Emmy. God, Emmy. She's hurting, and she's hurting bad, but she's also running. I remember Beck sitting me down after all that Nico garbage went down, and he explained to me why he wasn't home. He said that Emmy had left a letter resigning from her position at Core Security, effective immediately. She didn't leave details on where she was going, but did say that it was just too hard to stay, knowing that Coop was dead because he took a bullet meant for her. She didn't need to be here, but he did. The guilt and blame that she was carrying was unimaginable. Beck had gone to the office to send Maddox the location her GPS was picking up. Much to my shock, Maddox had placed a tracking device in her car almost a year ago, along with one in her purse, and it keeps her phone tracked. After explaining all of that to me, he dropped the bomb that Maddox was taking leave of absence to get my girl and bring her home. Yeah, I was beyond shocked that Maddox openly claimed Emmy. Between Coop's death and Emmy's running, something was awakened inside of Maddox. The last call Beck got from him was three nights ago, and he was no closer to getting her home. My heart broke for Emmy, but I had a feeling that, regardless of what happens, they have a climb ahead of them. After what I saw at Cohen's party a few months ago, I have no doubt that the demons he's fighting are all-consuming. Even if he manages to get her home, there's a lot of healing needed. Not saying that Emmy isn't less important than Maddox, but something tells me that the scars he has are far deeper than anyone could imagine. I pull into the parking lot of the complex where my office, core security, and sway salon are all located. My door is a good four businesses down from the boys, but theirs sits right next to Sway's. After Coop's funeral, I help Sway extend the sidewalk of gold glitter to extend all the way down to my door. I wanted a piece of that when I went to work. It's silly, gaudy, and sometimes obnoxious, but it's our thing. The other business owners love it, but then again, it's really hard not to love anything that Sway does. I just stepped out of the car when I noticed Sway through the window of his salon. He's waving like he normally does, loudly. I locked myself and walk his way. By the time I get to the sidewalk, he's already thrown the door to the salon open and is bouncing on his purple four-inch heels in anticipation. I love this man. D, my sweet, beautiful D, when are you going to let me have it, your marvelous shoe collection? I must have those two-tone Chanel knot-shaped pumps. Don't think I didn't notice them, you sneaky little devil. You went shopping without sway, and oh, my little diva, that is just not okay. He pauses, I'm sure, for dramatic effect before continuing. And that outfit, spin, spin. He brings one of his large hands off his hips long enough to spin his finger in a circle. You have the perfect outfit. Oh, darling, it is to die for. I could just take a bite out of your booty. You must tell me your secrets. He's right. I look damn good. But then again, I chose this outfit for my man today. I've got on one of my favorite dresses. The light pink color looks amazing against my tan, and the hemline hits mid-thigh, covering just enough leg that Beck won't flip his shit, but leaving the rest of my long legs bare. I know he has a weakness for my legs. He's never shy about reminding me, usually when they are wrapped around his waist. The bandage-style dress is as skin-tight as possible without looking trashy, hugs my figure, and pushes my breasts up. The bust is a weave of black and pink lines that make my already generous chest look even bigger. Two straps hug my shoulders and wrap around the top of my biceps. I finish the look with my five-inch black heels. I laugh and twirl until Sway stops moving his finger. He's got the biggest grin on his face. You are something else. I know what you're up to. You're going to seduce that fine hunk of yours. Don't think I don't know this. Good Lord, is he looking edible today. Walking sex, I'm telling you. That man is a walking, talking orgasm. I throw my head back and laugh because he isn't wrong. Beck is that good looking. Sway, what did I tell you about fantasizing about my man? He cocks his hip to the side, tosses his blonde hair over his shoulder and rolls his eyes. Then you should put a bag over his head. He pauses and seems to space out for a second. I don't even bother opening my mouth because I know he isn't done. Better yet, 
You're going to need to start stuffing his clothes, making him look good and thick so no one will look at him. He laughs before pulling me into a hug. I wrap my arms around his thick waist and hug him back. You're a mess, Sway, but I love you. I press my cheek against his silk blouse and enjoy the moment. Sway can be a bit much for anyone, but his heart is pure gold. He pulls back and his face gets serious for a second. He looks both ways before motioning me to lean closer. Have you seen him yet? Have I seen who, Beck? I honestly have no clue who he is talking about. I know Axel, Greg, and Beck are in today. Asher is at the house working from Beck's office, and Maddox is still, well, Maddox isn't here. I take a second to really look at Sway and notice the excitement written all over his face. Good Lord, he looks like he's about to pop. He leans in, moves my long brown hair off my shoulder, and whispers in my ear, The new one! Oh, my God! My senses tell me there is finally hope for one of those boys. My team, D. Do you hear me? This one is all over Team Rainbow. I can tell. By the time he finishes whispering, he might as well have just yelled that out loud. I pull back and look at him. I had no idea there was a new guy. Last I heard from back, they were just going to hire a temp to take Emmy's spot until she came back. You've got me swaying, I have no idea. But I guess I'll find out soon. He doesn't even give me a chance. He opens the door to his salon and yells to Brandy, the adorable pixie-like receptionist, that he's going next door to ogle the hunks. She laughs, clearly used to this from Sway, and waves him off. Does this mean you're coming with me? He doesn't answer, laces our hands together, and all but pulls me to the door of core security. The glass is tinted so we can't see in, but that doesn't stop Sway from vibrating his excitement. Would you calm down? You're going to jerk my arm right off my body. He doesn't respond, but the second I open the door, he rushes in, pulling me with him. I smile at Coop's portrait before my eyes sweep over to Emmy's desk. I've been so used to hearing her sweet voice over the years that the very masculine voice echoing through the room takes me off guard. When I look over and see just what has sway in knots, I can almost understand his ridiculous behavior. See what I mean? Gorgeous! He doesn't even try to keep his voice down and the object of his eyes looks right at him with a large smile. What the hell am I watching right now? This man is most definitely gorgeous. His blonde hair is perfectly styled, not a single piece out of place. His face is almost too perfect. High cheekbones, strong jaw, big smile, and perfectly white teeth. I can't tell from where I'm standing, but his eyes almost look violet. His body is partially hidden by the desk, but from what I can tell, the rest is just as good as his face. Strong shoulders and trim, muscular chest. And the best part? He hasn't even taken his eyes off Sway once. Hell, I might as well not even be in the room. Oh, my God! I want to jump up and clap my hands like a mad person. I feel like I'm watching that matchmaker show play out right in front of me. He finishes up his call and places the receiver down lightly, and turns his eyes back to Sway with a smile. Dilbert, it's great to see you again. Dilbert? There are only three people I know that call him that. His mother, Greg when he's annoyed, and Cohen, constantly. Davy. I stand here with my jaw dropped and watch as Sway walks over to Davy. Neither one of them have stopped smiling. Who knows how long I'm here just taking it all in, when a warm arm wraps around me, I jump, but when Beck's delicious scent washes over me, I smile just as big as the two lovebirds at the front desk. I turn, wrap my arms around his neck, and press my lips to his for a quick, but no less toe-curling kiss. When I fall back on my heels and look into his eyes so full of love, my smile grows so large it hurts. Hey, I whisper against his lips. Hey, Beck. His smile is just as panty-melting as it was the first time I saw him, and I can't help but think how lucky I am that this perfect man never gave up on me. I've got a present for you. His smile grows wicked and his eyes darken. He knows exactly what it means when I surprise him at work with a present. I run my hands down the thick corded muscles in his arm and grab one of his hands. Spinning on my heels, I start to walk. I hear him groan and turn around to see his eyes on my ass. Eyes up, John Beckett. You don't want to scare the children. I laugh and point over to Sway and Davy. They don't even notice us. 
but Beck narrows his eyes when he sees Sway. Sway, I told you to stop coming over here and getting your drool all over the counter. Let David do his job. Sway laughs and waves him off, and Davy slash David blushes. Oh, wow, Sway so called it. I can't wait to see how that plays out. Beck takes the lead and starts stomping down the hall. Whether he's impatient to get me in his office or he's frustrated with Sway's normal antics, who cares? He's taking me where I want to be, and I could care less how fast I have to run to keep up with him. When we walk into his office, he slams the door and clicks the lock with a loud pop. His body crushes against mine before I even have a chance to turn completely. His hands go right to my ass and his fingers dig in. I open my mouth when I feel his tongue lick across my bottom lip, begging for access. God, I missed you. I moan against his lips before crushing my mouth back to his. Our tongues slide and curl together in a kiss so demanding our teeth knock together, and our breathing becomes rapid in seconds. Only been two hours. He doesn't finish, just digs his fingers in deeper and lifts me off the floor. I wrap my legs around his waist, run my hand up his neck until I can push my fingers through his soft hair and palm his cheek with my other hand. We continue to kiss until he puts my ass down on his desk, forcing my legs and arms to fall from his body when he steps back. Tease, I whine when he doesn't make a move to come back to me. Oh, hell no. There's no way you're going to call me a tease when you come in here looking like that. Good God, D. I almost tore that dress from your body and took you right there in front of Sway and David. He adjusts his pants that are doing a poor job of hiding his large bulge. Well, aren't you lucky your willpower is stronger than mine? I jump off the desk, grab the package I need out of my purse, and push him back until he falls onto the couch against the wall. Sit and shut up. I undo his belt, unbutton his slacks, and slowly pull the zipper down. When his rock-hard cock springs out, I raise my brow in question. With you around, do you really think I bother any more with any unnecessary restrictions? His smart-ass tone dies when I wrap one of my hands around his thick length. I stroke him a few times, rubbing my thumb through the drop of cum beaded at the top, enjoying the velvety softness of his dick. My mouth waters, and I can tell by the expression on his face that he is more than ready for my mouth. I pull my hand away and want to laugh when he groans. When I bring the package from my purse into his line of sight, he tries to jump up. I push down on his hips and give him one wet lick across his swollen head. His head drops back and bangs against the wall. I rip open the package and tip a small amount in my mouth, enjoying the strawberry flavor and the sizzle against my tongue. I wait until he picks his head up and locks eyes with mine before I lower my mouth to his dick and open wide. I use my tongue and saliva to move the pop rocks around in my mouth, making sure that the soft pops bounce off his sensitive skin. The first one that sizzles and pops in my mouth causes his body to stiffen before his fingers push into my hair almost painfully. I pause, waiting to see if he's going to pull me off. But when his hips start to rock slightly, that's all the encouragement I need. Slowly and carefully, I keep taking his dick in my mouth, pausing a few times to put more pop rocks in my mouth. With each sizzle and pop against his shaft, he moans loudly, and his fingers constrict in my hair. Fuck, D. He breathes. God damn. I bring my hand up and circle my fist around him, pumping in turn with my mouth. My tongue swirls around his thick head every time I bring my head up and wraps it around his shaft with every slide down. I can tell he's getting closer, so I drop the candy on the floor and bring my other hand up to caress his balls. He doesn't miss a beat. His hips rock with my mouth and my homes of excitement dance with his grunts and groans. D, if you don't mean to come in your mouth and back off. No, baby. I take him deeper, until I have to relax my throat to pull him even deeper. I swallow with my lips open wide and the tip of his dick as deep as I can get it. When he feels my throat close around him, he goes solid and breathes my name. D. I keep milking him until the last tremble quivers through his body, and then unlatch my mouth with a pop. I lean back rest my ass on my heels and smile up at his flushed face. Sorry, baby. I didn't think to bring you lunch. But now that I got mine, I can run out and get you something. I smile as innocently as I can before he pushes his body off the couch and knocks me to the floor in a fit of laughter. You, my wildcat, are crazy. Where in the hell did you hear about that? 
I'm not sure if he even cares about my answer because he's too busy pushing my dress up my legs. No, Beck, that was for you. His hand's still, and he looks at me clearly confused. You've been working hard, long hours, and I know you're stressed. I just wanted to do something to ease some of that tension you seem to be stuck with. His forehead falls to mine, and his eyes close. I run my hands through his hair and wait for him to control himself before lifting my lips, asking for him to let me up. He finally stands and tucks himself back in his pants. You better hurry out of that door before I change my mind. I don't like being the only one who gets something out of our lovemaking. You perfect man. I shake my head and cup his cheek. I got plenty out of that. And tonight when you get home, you can return the favor. I lean up and press a soft kiss against his lips, fix my dress, and walk out the door. Sway is still standing at the front desk when I walk out. I offer him a smile and wave, but he doesn't even turn his head. I just keep going and make my way to the car. I drive all the way home with a big smile on my face. Back. How the hell I made it through the rest of the day after Dee left was beyond me. When she walked out the door, I snatched up the package of candy she left on the floor and tucked them in my desk. Hey, you never know. I make a mental note to find out whoever told her about that little trick so I can thank them. Holy shit, when the first pop bounced against my dick, I didn't know what to think. But that was without a doubt the best blowjob I had ever gotten. Fuck, I came so hard I'm pretty sure I blacked out for a second. I managed to get about three hours of work done before I can't take it anymore. She had drained me dry, but I'm craving her body now. I say a quick goodbye to Axel and Greg before heading out to the front. I know that Sway left about thirty minutes after Dee did, so at least I won't have to drag him out so poor David can get some work done. Not that it matters, because there's no way I'm standing in the way of that. David is a nice guy, and clearly he doesn't mind Sway's attention. See you later, David, I call over my shoulder. I hear him say something, but my mind is too focused on getting home. When I pull in the driveway and notice that Asher's truck is gone, my anticipation jumps through the roof. A night alone with D? There isn't much that would make me happier. I sit in my truck for a second and think back to the night before and my dinner with D. Do you want to tell me why we had to come all the way into Atlanta? I figured we could just stay home tonight. I smiled and shook my head. Nope, as much as I love sharing our nights with Asher, I needed some time alone with my girl. She smiled and took my hand as we walked into the restaurant. We continued to make small talk and just enjoy each other. These were the times I cherished the most. For so long we didn't have this, the connection and companionship. The all-consuming love was there, but now that it's recognized and returned, just being with her made all the stress and worry from work fall from my shoulders. After paying the check, she smiled and took a bite of her chocolate cake, making me smile when I thought back to the early days that we knew each other and her ridiculous theory that chocolate was better than sex. I love you. You know that? She looked up from her plate and smiled. Yeah, I know that. And I love you. Before she could take another bite, I took her fork from her hand and moved her plate out of the way, placing the box I'd had tucked into my jacket in its place. What's this? I didn't forget something, did I? God, she was adorable when she crinkled her brows in confusion. Nope, you didn't forget anything. I picked this up about two weeks ago when Izzy came to the office. Her confusion grew, and I reached forward to rub my finger over the wrinkles between her brows. She opened the long box, and I saw a smile form, and the confusion vanished. How did you know I wanted one of these... She pulled the necklace out of the box and took a second to take it all in. Izzy had come into the office almost a month ago, selling some silly locket things. She kept calling them living lockets or some weird shit like that. But when I started looking through it all, the idea popped in my head and I couldn't resist. It was just pure luck that Dee mentioned wanting one of these origami owl things. I watched her face taking in all the charms that I ordered to go inside the locket. She moved the little key attachment I included and looked deeply at the locket. I sat back and ran the checklist over in my mind. The key attached to the necklace was to symbolize her holding the key to my heart. Yeah, about as corny as it got, but it's the truth. 
There were the two word charms, faith and love, which she shouldn't need any help figuring out. Then the house charm that represented her making her home with me. The high heel shoe, because, well, it's D. My smile grew when I thought about the chocolate bar. I knew the exact moment when she hit the last charm in there, a little diamond ring. Her eyes shot up and locked with mine. I took note of her quivering lip and unshed tears before I stood up and pushed my chair back and knelt in front of her seat. I gently tugged the necklace from her grip, brought it around her neck, and latched it. I ran my finger down the chain, around the locket, and flicked the key clipped to the top. When I looked up and met her eyes with a smile, she tried to return it. Pulling her left hand forward with one hand, I pushed the other into my pants pocket and brought the ring out. I'd been carrying this sucker around for the last six weeks, just waiting for the perfect time. Since the day I met you, I knew you would be someone worth fighting for. We've been through so much together, and it still feels like our love is brand new. There isn't anything in this world that would make me happier than making you my wife. D, baby, will you marry me? Her tears spilled over and her beautiful smile shone through. Her head nodded and through her soft hiccups I heard the best words in the world. God, yes! I slid the ring on her finger and stood up, pulling her from her chair at the same time and took her lips in a bruising kiss. With the other patrons clapping in the background, I kissed my girl and showed her just how much I love her with one single kiss. When we finally came up for air, I framed her face in my hands and swiped the tears away with my thumbs. She just stood there, smiling the smile that never failed to bring me to my knees. The smile that was gone for so long, but every day since it had been back, I thanked my lucky stars. She thinks I saved her, but the truth is, she saved me. Her love gave me a purpose, a reason, and the strength to stand by her side and fight any war that is thrown our way. With a smile on my face, I make my way into the house that I share with the woman I love, with every intention of dragging her up to our room and making her mine, all night long. This concludes Beck by Harper Sloan. Narrated by Abby Creighton and Sean Crisden. Copyright 2013 by E.S. Harper. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Harper Sloan and was produced in the year 2014 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers. Or call toll free 877 7 Tantor to request a catalog.